appreciate it. And we continue on here. Did I ever send out that tweet? Yeah, I did. All right, good. Uh, just to make sure. Joey Hayes, good to see you. Good morning to you over the UK. Kurt Seltzer with a splash of lime. Nice to have you here. Hey, YJ, how you doing, buddy? Jose, nice to see you, my friend. Uh, the gorgeous Pam McSee has arrived, everyone. We can officially start the show. Waylon, good to have you here. Bassmaster, good to see you, bud. The gorgeous and talented Kara McIver is here, everyone. She's in Saskatchewan. Give us a wave, Kara, so everybody in North America can see you. Sweet Donnie D, nice to have you back. And I said gorgeous Helena already, but uh, there's another one. And 416, uh, gorgeous Donna C, how are you two? The stunning Science Melinda from Australia. There's uh, the gorgeous Cosmic Fleur. There she is, just sneaking on in, just like that. Kevin, what's going on? Ozzy, Ozzy, oi, oi to you. Uncle Dale in your power stash. Looking great tonight, the power stash in Austin, Texas. If you find Uncle Dale, rub it for three weeks of good luck. Julio, nice to have you here. Bob Birkins, nice to see you. Uh, my brother Eugene, thanks for coming on in. The gorgeous Tammy Finnegan. And we're going to have to call it right there after the Ronald Penton because it is time. Get your horns up. Let's do it right now. Hey, hey. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show and our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Space Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out the Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Ah, uh, here we go. Troy Taylor is the author of more than 130 books on ghosts, hauntings, true cl- crime, the unexplained, and the supernatural. Yes, he is also the founder of American Hauntings, Inc., which offers books, ghost tours, events, and weekend excursions. Born in Illinois and raised in the Midwest, Troy began his writing career in 1994. Over the years, he has created nearly a dozen different ghost tours and founded Haunted America Conference, Hopefully one day I could speak at that. Maybe if I just beg tonight. If I just beg. Because I like talking some ghosts every now and again. But you know what? This is only his second time on Spaced Out Radio. His website, AmericanHauntings.net. I highly suggest you check it on out. Troy Taylor, thank you so much, my friend. It's been a long time since we've chatted, but it's good to have you back here on Spaced Out Radio, man. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be back. So I, uh, when you're, you know, somebody from the show, a producer got a hold of me and wanted me to come on in the middle of the night. I said, man, I'll only do it for Dave. So that's <laughs> it. I'm nobody else. This is, this is past my bedtime. <laughs> it's past mine every night, man. It's past yeah, yeah. mine every night. <laughs> You know, but it's good to have you back, man, because, you know, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Since you were last on the show, I literally dropped the amount of paranormal stories that that we and adventures we have on this because you know the paranormal always seems to be going through a constant state of change where yeah. you have a lot of credibility you have a lot of people new coming in because of the television shows and everybody's an expert now demonologists yeah. running rampant you've been a paranormal investigator for three weeks but no you're going to be our demonologist they don't yeah. know what the hell they're talking about throwing around the word science every now and again how have you been able to stay away from that crowd to have your own success by by kind of staying to myself and doing my own thing i guess um yeah i I know what you mean about that i i don't and and this is we we literally had this discussion because i remember you and i talking about this 
we were talking about all kinds of equipment and stuff and how useless it was. I mean, this was the last time I was on and really my mind really hasn't changed much since then. I, uh, I kind of still feel the same way. I, I don't see how with the, you know, most of the current crop of things that are going on based, like you said, on whatever television show someone watched last week, people are always talking about how they're going to scientifically prove there are ghosts. No, you're that's never going to happen ever. Science, for one thing, would never accept it. And B, in order to prove something scientifically, you've got to repeat it over and over and over again under controlled settings. Now, does that sound like the actual paranormal to you? No, there is no controlled setting. So, yeah, that's that's never going to happen. I that, I think that's why I have always been such a proponent of the history of not only the history of ghost and ghost hunting but as far as the history of different locations if, if you're gonna if you're gonna try to come up with actual evidence of something it's it's history that's gonna do it um but i i you know it's just tough and that's not something history isn't something that plays well on a one-hour television show so that's never gonna happen either so you know i don't know man i i'd like to to say i've got some kind of big secret but i really don't i i just kind of continue to embrace the same way I've been doing stuff since like 1994, you know, it, you know, writing about the history, writing about the events that have happened, writing about the people who have had the experiences. Um, I think that's what, I don't know, it's what makes me happy. And it seems to appeal to the people who are out normally out there buying my books. So I just keep doing what I'm doing. For you, as you uh, kind of stand on the outside looking in of this mess that we like to make fun of the paranormal, <laughs> there are some very good, talented, smart individuals in this field. It's easy to rap on everybody who is doing things wrong. It's easy to focus on the negative. But do you, everybody wants to blame television for this. You know, television is the one that created everything's a demon. Television is the one that created everybody can be a ghost hunter, you know, because there is no education in the field to to expand horizons. There's no bachelor's degrees or or even associate degrees or anything like that. But for you, do you blame television for the downfall of the paranormal, or do you think it's the people in general who are not taking that time to learn? Well, I think, I mean, you can, you can say that television, um, you know, sort of enhanced the issue, the problem, but it's been around longer than that. I mean, it's, um, even before there were all these television shows, you had the same kind of thing. People would, in that point, they would, you know, read a book and just decide that, oh, I know everything there is to know. And that would be the end of that. Um, I, television just made it worse. I mean, the, the whole demon thing, you know, that's, that's television embraced something that was already running around out there. You know, when and blaming demons for every ghost story and every haunting that takes place, you can trace that back. Unfortunately, you know, you can trace it back to people like the Warrens who were pushing demons, you know, back in the early 80s and late 70s. You know, they were already pushing that. And a lot of people and it was weird because when I first got started, you know, when the Internet was was born was about the time I had already, I'd had some writing I'd done before that, but I really started to make more contact with people across the country rather than just around Illinois. And as I did, I began to find these people who were talking about demons all the time. And all of them seemed to be from New England. So I always had this thing in my head that like, these people in New England are crazy. I don't know <laughs> what's going on up there, you know? Uh, but but it's you know, but you'll find that it just depends on what part of the country you come from. So we, we can't blame it all on TV, but it has definitely made everything worse. Uh, people have, you know, will we'll, we'll watch something on television and then they uh, immediately assume that to do an investigation, a thorough investigation of someplace only takes an hour. You know, I mean, even if it's a time lapse thing in one night, you're going to know if a place is haunted. No, no, it doesn't work that way. But it's hard for when people are getting excited about it, you don't want to just shut them down. I mean, you know, for all we know, there may be somebody out there who saw an episode of a television show that they enjoyed and decided that they want to get into ghost hunting 
And for all we know, that person may be the person who comes along with some kind of really great theory that really opens up some doors. I mean, assuming they've they actually get out and do more research rather than just watching television. So, no, I, I don't blame it all on TV. I just think it's made it worse. But, you know, when we uh, when we do events and stuff and we do uh, the conference every year and that kind of thing, we um, you know, we don't do I mean, probably everybody at this point. Is there anybody in the field that hasn't been on at least a TV show? I mean, I think everybody's, yeah, well, most people seem to have played on one or something, you know, and usually it turns out to be a bad experience in some way. But, um, you know, but we don't we don't really go and seek out people who are, oh, I've got a TV show. I mean, I don't have anything to say, anything really to talk about, but I did do a TV show. Well, I don't want to hear about your you know, the episodes of the shows that you filmed and that kind of thing, and not at a conference, you know, we want it to be a, a speaker based thing. So I tend to try to avoid that kind of thing. As far as the big celebrity thing goes, um, this is not really, it's just not really my thing. I, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm old enough at this point to be like the, the parent of some of these people who claim to be experts in the field. You know, I could be their dad or their, I'm, you know, they're so, They've been around for such a short amount of time, um, but um, I don't know if that just makes me old or makes them too young or I don't know. But, um, yeah, yeah, TV is uh, is one of those things that, that, you know, people get all excited about. I don't really understand why, but they do. And um, I don't know. I, like I said I can't blame it all, but I will say it's made it worse. How's that? Well, let, let, let's talk about something positive here for a quick second. What what actually drives you after almost thirty years of doing this to continue the paranormal? What do you love about this field? Well, I I I I really love uh, all the history behind it. Uh, I mean, that's that's my big thing. Is that's that's what I dive into first. It's always the history because without it, you don't have a good ghost story. Well, without it, you don't have a haunting at all. So you've you've got to have a good history. And I um. I, I was telling you before we went on the air that during the pandemic, I wrote like nine books uh, because I didn't really have anything else to do. But the thing is, I would be doing it anyway, as long as I have the time. Uh, I've always got, you know, like 10, 15 projects lined up. I'll never stop. So I think that I just I just really love the mystery of it all. Um, you know, I don't think that we'll ever, there's a lot of things we'll never solve. There are a lot of things. I mean, I have a list of things that I need to know the answer to when I die. I mean, I actually keep a list. I'm like, I don't want to make communication with anybody that's still here. I mean, do I want to stay around as a ghost? Well, sure. Absolutely. I mean, that'd be a blast, you know, to just to mess with people. But, um, I have a list of things that I'm going to need answers to. So I, I that's I think that's probably one of the things that keeps me going is that somewhere I, I'm always going to have a question about something. And so I want to research about it and so I can write about it because I really love what I do. I really do love it, whether it's, you know, writing about true crime, or writing about the paranormal. It's all about the history. And I think that's what keeps me. That's what keeps me excited about it. I just I, I do love it. See, one of the things that absolutely interests me about the paranormal, Troy, is, you, like you said, it's the history. I don't care about Waverly Hills. I don't care about Alcatraz or, you know, how everybody has to head to Gettysburg every year to go find the soldiers still fighting the battle. What I love to hear, and if I were to, if I had the money to put together a, a real good television show, I want to be traveling across North America in a motorhome filled with paranormal and UFO gear and whatever else we're looking for and and literally go to all of these small little towns that are buried in the hills way off the path of the major highways because all of those towns have their own little quirks. They have their own little ghost story from the Midwest or, or up here for the Gold Rush Trail. And these stories are just sitting there begging to be told and nobody's touching them because Waverly Hills, Gettysburg, and the rest. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't. Um, I mean, I've gotten I've gotten most of that kind of stuff out of my system over the years. So a lot of the stuff that I write about now is a little more obscure, which um, that's the beauty of being able to do whatever would write about what you want is you can just pick and choose your your projects. I mean, I don't honestly I don't want to write about Alcatraz or Gettysburg or any of those places anymore. I've already done all that. You know, I want to do something else. And I agree with you that every town has its ghost stories. There are so many uh, obscure stories that people don't know that are just as fascinating as, you know, the, the famous places. And, and a lot of times much more reliable. Um, I wrote one of the books I wrote last summer was about a series of supernatural related axe murders that happened in Texas and Louisiana in the early 1900s. There'd never been another book written about it. And it I got it all from newspaper stories and archives. And it was probably one of the most fascinating stories that I've ever gotten a chance to dig into because all of it had this, you know, mystical kind of supernatural cause behind the murders. And um, it's been one of those things that, you know, I have to explain it to people so that they'll buy the book because it's they've never heard of it. Well, come on. That's the whole point here. <laughs> you know, or, or don't you want to hear about it? <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. And that would be not only would it be a great show, but it would also be a lot of fun just to get to do it. Well, th and that's exactly the point, Troy. I mean, I think of my community that literally... In 1988, there was a, a lady named Miriam Delicato, and we're coming up to the 31st anniversary or 33rd anniversary of this, where she was, her and her friends were followed by a UFO for about 150 miles. And literally, out, just on the hill outside of my town, they were pulled, the car was pulled over by the UFO. The three other people in the car were put into a zombie-like state, and she was taken for three hours. And I look at, like, my community is only 1,800 people. Those are the stories that I want. Those are the stories that excites me. Or, or you have some bar that was, you know, in a big shootout in some dust devil town in the middle of Arizona. Mm -hmm. Then the bar, yeah. maybe the bar building is gone, but the bar is still there with the bullet holes, the stories yeah. that that could tell. Yeah. That's yeah. what intrigues Absolutely. me. Yeah. You know, how do we get there? Yeah, I know it's, um, there, there, I wish there was more time in every day <laughs> because it's I there just isn't enough time in a day. I was working on stuff today. I looked down, it's like two in the afternoon. I'm like, how, what happened? How did I get here? You know, uh, I don't think I was abducted at any point. So I assume I've been sitting there at the desk, but I lost some time and it happens far too often. And so I don't get as many projects done as I would like. And um, I can lose myself in an archive, you know, in an online archive and, hours go by because I'm digging for some story about a guy who, you know, jumped out of a window of a hotel and, you know, now this ghost haunts the place. Nobody's ever heard of the hotel. Nobody knows anything about the story, but I don't care because it's fascinating. You know, it's so fascinating. Um, I grew up in a town about the same size as, as yours, 1700 people. Uh, as a matter of fact, a farm community out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of Illinois and um, when I was a kid and I was in high school, I was already collecting, you know, ghost stories and things from around town. And I knew some folks that lived in this this house that they claimed was haunted and they tell me all kinds of stories. And, you know, and I always just thought, wow, that's a cool story. You know, and I thought, well, I'll probably never do anything with that. Uh, then a few years ago, I was working on a book about um, farm murders and ghost stories attached to them and uh, i started digging through this newspaper archive about this guy who had uh murdered his wife with a straight razor this farmer and then had killed himself and cut his own throat and left his son alive and um turns out not only was it in the town where my parents lived where i had grown up but it was my friend from high school's haunted house and so it all just sort of gelled together. And I had no idea that there was a real story behind his story. But nobody in town 
knew that. It happened in like 1905. There wasn't anybody who knew anything about this murder or suicide that had taken place there. All we knew is that, you know, Brad lived in a haunted house. <laughs> That's all we knew. So, yeah, there are great stories out there. It's just a matter of digging for them. It really is. Out of all the digging that you have ever done, what's your top two that you just, you never knew existed, you found them, and you're like, holy crap. Wow. Well, I, um, I, one of them, one of them was a hotel as I was kind of on that thing about the hotel. Um, there's a hotel and it's in Chicago, but it's not a famous place. I mean, most people outside of it have never heard of, of it. I only knew that it was haunted because some of the, I knew some guys who worked there at one time and were telling me ghost stories about this place. And I'd always heard it was haunted and I'd heard a lot of, you know, kind of BS stories about, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's Teddy Roosevelt who spoke there, or maybe it's, you know, all these people that, you know, all these supposedly famous people. So I got, I was working on some stuff about hotels and I, so I started digging through literally daily, every mention I could find of this particular hotel in the newspapers for a hundred years. And I found that there had not only had there been, you know, um, about a dozen different murders there, there had been about 150 accidental deaths and about 75 suicides oh my. in a story in this hotel. Well, is it any wonder that it's so haunted? Uh, so it kind of got away from me because I couldn't, I had to, I had to write down every single one, <laughs> you know, I had to, I had to document every different one that was anywhere odd. I had to document it. And so, yeah, that was one of those kind of rabbit holes that I ended up getting stuck in. Um, beyond that, I, I'd have to say that um, I, gosh, it was in the late nineties. I moved to a little town on the Mississippi river and um at that point, there really hadn't been been much documentation done about, um, you know, any of the hauntings. Everybody talked about it being haunted and such. So I started to kind of research and and collect some of the history about this place. And um, I guess probably what was the most interesting about it is there had always been this ghost story about this woman that people had seen that you know smelled like a jasmine perfume and that she was a ghost that haunted the staircase but nobody knew why they just kind of made up stories to kind of explain it over the years and uh, it turned out there had been a woman even though no one had ever died on the staircase there had been a woman who had um had had committed suicide in one of the rooms there in the building in the hotel and um there was a big scandal over it. She went unidentified for almost a week before her husband finally stepped forward and said, oh yeah, by the way, that's my wife. Needless to say, not a great marriage. Um, but there was a, a, a backstory to this about her depression and her need to have children that she'd never been able to have and all these kinds of things. And this was all, you know, it was all interesting. It was fascinating. And it, you know, it kind of made sense. Well, you know who, maybe she's the ghost, but there's no way to figure that out until I had the chance to meet a guy who came to the hotel because he was her nephew. And he's, this is, this was in 1965 when she died. And so he's quite a bit older. He was only six when she died and he had come there because he knew that's where she had taken her own life and he wanted to see the place for himself. So I gave him a little tour and took him up to the room where she had died and it's still intact. And uh, he was weeping, telling stories about, you know, growing up, being a little kid and her just being gone one day. And, you know, he kept talking and, and, you know, how much he enjoyed her. He would stay at her house, you know, after he got out of school, before his parents came home from work. And one of the things that he always disliked about the only thing he disliked about staying with his aunt was that whenever he'd go home, his mom would always make him take a bath because she couldn't stand the smell of his aunt's perfume, this really strong jasmine perfume that she always wore. Troy, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. When we come back with the amazing author, Troy Taylor, fantastic beard. I know you can't see that on radio, but just fantastic beard and hair combination. He is going to get into exorcisms. What is an exorcism? And the big one in St. Louis back in way back in 
in the year my father was born in 1949. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio coming up right after this. Before we go any further, uh, yeah. uh, we got uh, a birthday in our chat room tonight. The gorgeous Cosmic Floor has turned 30. 30th trip around the sun. Happy birthday, Cosmic Floor. We'll give you a few claps. <laughs> I hope you have just a, a, an absolute wonderful uh, evening, and thank you for allowing us to be a part of your birthday. So much love to you from all of us at Spaced Out Radio. Yeah, there we go. Got that out. I always like to do little things like that. That makes me feel good. It's her birthday and she's here. Yay. Uh, Michael Huntington is listening in. Big fan. I know Michael. He's a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. Very good guy. Yeah, let's see here. What else do we got? Anything else exciting happening? Um, let's see here. Well, hey, you know it's good when you got a Chad Smith birthday wish good. That's right. <laughs> yeah, Kurt Seltzer says it good here, uh, Troy. With a big beard comes big responsibility. <laughs> Black Rabbit, how you doing, man? Good to have you here. Man, this is good stuff. Good crowd tonight. Good crowd. I'm just pumped up for this show, man. <laughs> Are you still getting tattoo work done? Oh, yeah. Well, off and on. You know, off and on. Not, not as much in the last year, obviously. So, you know, things have slowed down a little bit. But yeah. yeah, I got to try and get some know. more. They're addicting. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that's yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, I always laugh when people go, oh, I like your tattoo. Well, I mean, I guess it's so much. It is just like one now. <laughs> it's all connected. It, I suppose. It's still but, plural. You know. <laughs> it's still plural. I'm going to move yeah. my mic here. Try and get, I'm getting a little bit more feedback here. So, I'm just trying to reposition my mic here, here so that way. <sighs> I think. Oh, oh, somebody uh, asked about my shirt. It's a, it's an Edgar Allan Poe shirt. I didn't know I would be on camera tonight, so it just says, "I do not suffer from insanity. I enjoy every minute of it." That's Edgar a beautiful Allen. one. Yeah. It's a beautiful one. <laughs> All right, there's a gorgeous Jessica McCreary. She has returned, people. Yes, she has returned. All right. Anybody else come on in? And no, we're good. We are good. Hmm. Nine books during the pandemic. Your fingers must be killing you. Yeah, no, nah, I'm used to it. <laughs> I'm used to it. I write for like two hours on a computer. And my fingers are killing me. <laughs> yeah, well, I did. Uh, I think I came down with, um, I, I did come down with some, well, I called it writer's elbow, but tennis elbow for a while. Uh, but I don't know that it was from that. Oh, it probably God. was, but it doesn't matter. I'm not going to stop anyway, so I just kept doing it. So, How do you not get writer's block? Writer's block? Yeah. I, I don't know. Never had it. Oh, you're I don't, lucky. I don't know. I just, um, you know, it, it, it's just one of those kind of, I just don't ever, I don't know. It's just not something that has ever really bothered me. 
you're lucky. I mean, I've got days that are harder to start than others, maybe, but not once I get going, I'm fine. But no, nah, it's just not really. I've just got so many, um, I don't know, so many, so many plans, so many ideas, so many projects I want to work on that uh, I'm always afraid that I'll, you know, for whatever reason, won't be able to write anymore and I won't be able to finish them and I have to finish them. I have to get them out. So, right. you know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because I got to just uh, say uh, thank you to Cat Chaser for the awesome super chat and kicking things off tonight on the super chat. It's a great way to support what we do on this show. Thank you to all the veterans out there who are listening in. You always got a safe home here with us at spaced out radio and to all our regulars who are tuning on in. We absolutely love you. Here we go. The second half hour. Second half hour of Space Down Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We got a plethora of features for you. Our brand new site launched yesterday. Highly suggest you check it on out. Lots of cool features, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. And on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with author Troy Taylor. AmericanHaunting.net is his website. And we're talking ghosts, paranormal. And we're going to start off way back in St. Louis in 1949. There was an exorcism there. A lot of people, Troy, may not know what an exorcism is. Could you break it down for us? Well, um, well, we, let's go with the... Um... Let's go with the the Catholic Church definition of an exorcism, which is the removal of uh, some sort of demonic entity from inside of someone's body that is causing them to behave in a way that is um, outside the norm. Uh, There is criteria that has to be reached before an exorcism can be um, actually gotten permission for from the hierarchy of the church. Um, A person who is believed to be possessed um, has to have spoken in a foreign language uh, that they don't already know. Uh, They have to be, uh, there there have to be movement of physical objects around them by paranormal means. Uh, There would have to have been knowledge of events, future events or events outside of their uh, normal range of knowledge that they would know something about. Um, they would also have to have an aversion to holy objects. Um, there's a there's a list of things that you know fit the criteria of of someone who is possessed. And if a priest does encounter someone that he believes is possessed, uh, then permission has to be granted by the local bishop or archbishop for an exorcism to take place. And they're not like the movies. Um, When an exorcism does occur, they can last anywhere from three days to three months, sometimes longer. Sometimes they go on for years. Uh, And there have been cases. Um, Now I'm saying all these things as, as if I absolutely, (laughs) I absolutely believe everything about exorcisms. Um, or possession. Um, I really don't, I don't have any special knowledge of the reality of possessions or exorcisms. Um, What I can tell you is that historically speaking, um, I can find in this particular case, at least with the St. Louis exorcism case, is that something did happen to this child, to his family, uh, to the priests who were there, to the monks who attended to him, um, something happened in this case. There, something. Now, whether or not it was actually a demon or whether there was some sort of other explanation, and there are lots of theories, most of which don't add up, but there are lots of theories out there. 
Um, this is, as far as I can tell, one of the most legitimate cases, at least as far as witnesses go, um, as far as documentation goes. Normally, there isn't this kind of material on a, on a exorcism. But the 1949 exorcism was a little different than anything that had happened in this country before. And so it was modern times. Uh, the only thing they didn't have or that I wish they had had been recordings of everything. But they did document the things that happened in what was going to be a how-to guide for future exorcists. But it didn't work out that way. <laughs> they decided to keep everything a secret. And in fact, we wouldn't even know about this exorcism if it hadn't been for several coincidences that happened in the 1970s that actually got the information out there that we were able to learn about it. So in this specific case back in 1949 in St. Louis, what happened there? Well, it, it started actually in Maryland. Uh, it did not start in St. Louis. And um, before I before I get into this, let me preface this by saying that um, just last week, I was able to put out a new edition of a book that I wrote about this case. Originally came out in 2006. And at that time, everything about this case was still pretty mysterious. Not a lot of information had been released. Um, at that time, while I knew the names of everyone who was involved, I had to get a, um, I had to get, I gave, I gave my, a promise to the boy who was the center of this exorcism that I would not release his name as long as he was alive. So I didn't, um, he passed away in May of 2020. And so then when I, um, did a new edition of the book, I'm able to use his name. So I, I will use it tonight. I've never used it in a live interview before. So this is the first time that I've actually ever spoken his name out loud live. Uh, but when I spoke to him in, in 2004, that was the condition that we had. Um, and since he has since passed away, I don't feel that I have to keep that promise anymore, obviously. Uh, but the case itself started in Cottage City, Maryland. And um, the reason it ended up back in St. Louis is because that's where the family was originally from. Um, the boy's mother, uh, Edwin and Odell Hunkler, were um, natives of St. Louis. They had grown up there. They had family there. But he had moved to the Washington, D.C. area in the in electrical business was what he was in. Uh, on June 1st, 1935, they had a son named Ronald. Uh, so Ronald Hunkler, Ron, Ronald Edwin Hunkler was the boy's name. Uh, he went by the nickname of Ronnie and had a fairly normal childhood other than he was probably what we can, would consider today a diagnosis today of probably like ADHD, something like that. Um, he was a uh, loner, didn't have a lot of friends, uh, was often picked on and in turn would pick on younger children. But he also lived with a mother and a grandmother who just were super religious and just smothered him. But we don't have to get into every single detail in this case. What what I want to should shoot for is that on January 15th of 1949, strange things began to happen in their house. There were banging sounds. There were scratching sounds. There were weird noises. Uh, nobody knew what was going on at first. Um, Edwin had contacted an exterminator with the idea that maybe it was rats or mice in the house. He couldn't find anything. Uh, he said, I, you know, I don't know what's going on, but um, you don't, you don't have mice. Um, but this continued and it became more obvious that it was not, you know, rodents under the floor. It was banging and it was knocking. And soon the bed was moving. When Ronnie would go to bed at night, uh, he would get onto the bed. It would start to shake and vibrate, move across the floor. Um, his mother and his grandmother began to believe that it was his aunt who was haunting him. Now, they came up with this idea after she died, which was about 11 days after all the strange things happened. So to me, it seems very unlikely it would be her ghost since she wasn't even dead when everything started, but they were convinced it was. And that was one of those things that became a big part of the early part of the case. Eventually, this stuff kept going on and happening 
And then at night, Ronnie would often go into these kind of trances where he'd start to yell and scream and, 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 and make all kinds of noises and bark and growl. And he'd contort. Scratches started appearing on his body. He had to be taken out of school because one day he was sitting in class and the desk, the study desk that he was sitting at began shaking and vibrating and moving across the floor. And the teacher, of course, said, you know, what are you doing? Stop doing that. And he's, I'm not doing it. And it's actually just moving. So his parents took him out of school. He didn't go back until the following year. Uh, but as this stuff started to escalate, they contacted their Lutheran minister because they were still thinking that Ronnie was being haunted by his aunt who had died in St. Louis. Uh, they had been really close. That was his aunt Matilda or Tilly, as she was known. And um, there were there have been all kinds of stories about how Aunt Tilly gave Ronnie a Ouija board. None of those stories are true. Um, that that's the that's the thing. I you know not only did I dig in and do all the research on this stuff. I mean not even not just newspapers and archives and not just the the, the priest diary, but I actually talked to the people who were there. I mean, I talked to family members. I talked to the last living priests. I talked to the last living witness who was an Alexian monk. Um, I even talked to uh, Ronnie, but he didn't really have anything to say. He always told me he could never remember the actual exorcism. So, um, but I still was able to kind of put some of this stuff together. And there was no Ouija board involved. That was a case of, of, of the movie in the book influencing our version of the stories. Because in the movie... Reagan has a Ouija board, but in real life, there were no Ouija boards involved. Um, so you can leave that part of it out. Um, but anyway, as things went on, he contacted the Lutheran minister who, you know, set up prayer circles and things. I mean, you know, they don't, um, Lutheran ministers don't really deal with you know, exorcisms or possession. I don't even think he was considering this idea, at least not at first. But he was there to witness some things happen, things moving around, things flying across the room. One night he invited Ronnie to stay at his house, thinking maybe if I get him out of his house, if this is all a hoax, then, you know, I can prove it because he'll be at my house. So Ronnie is, is in the, the, a twin bed in the master bedroom. And as soon as he gets into bed, bed starts to shake and bang against the wall. So the minister is still thinking, well, you know, this could just be a hoax. He puts Ronnie in a chair on the other side of the room. Well, the chair starts to shake and then it tips forward and dumps him out onto the floor. So one last thing, he decides he's going to just have Ronnie sleep on a pallet on the floor. So he lays down on some blankets. He gets on a pillow. He falls asleep. About 15 minutes after he falls asleep, Reverend Schultz, this Lutheran minister, looks over and he sees Ronnie sliding across the floor of the bedroom and slides all the way under the, under the twin bed that he'd been sleeping on. Well, at that point, he knew that there was something to this, but... Again, he didn't think it had anything to do with ghosts or demons. He thought that it was a poltergeist case. So he contacted J.B. Ryan down at Duke University in North Carolina and to tell him about this case. And um, by the time that J.B. Ryan was able to come up to investigate for himself, the family had already left and gone to St. Louis. So um, he missed that case. But um, the, the story goes that um, the story goes that the Lutheran minister told the family that since Lutherans don't know anything about exorcisms, they could, should contact the Catholics because the Catholics know about these things. Now, I'm positive he never said that, but, it, but it's, it's always a good line, so it's always fun to say. Uh, but they did contact the Catholic Church because, well, the Catholics know about exorcisms. Um, there was a priest who was involved, Father Albert Hughes, and uh, he never met with Ronnie. He just listened to the story over the telephone and gave the family some prayer candles with the idea that maybe that would help. You know, maybe they could, um, you know, say some prayers and whatever was going on wouldn't hurt anything. Now, again, we get into the false part of the story about how Father Hughes tried to do an exorcism on Ronnie in Georgetown Hospital. And Ronnie slipped out of his restraints and slashed him with a bed spring and injured him so badly he was never able to lift his arm for the rest of his life and he had a nervous breakdown and went, none of that's true either um i mean i i know what father hughes was doing in 1949 i've actually seen the records at the church 
that St. James Church in Mount Rainier, where he was the pastor. I've seen the records. I know he was doing baptisms and funerals and all kinds of weddings and everything during the time he supposedly was locked up in a mental hospital. So there are a lot of parts of the story that just don't add up. Um, But on the other hand, there are some things that are a little tougher to explain, like how the family ended up in St. Louis. According to their version of events, what they told the Jesuits in St. Louis, that Odell, Ronnie's mom, was discussing with their husband out of Ronnie's earshot, nowhere nearby, that maybe they should try taking him to St. Louis, that maybe things would get better if they did. And then she hears a scream from the bedroom, goes running in where Ronnie's grandma and a couple of cousins were there. And on Ronnie's chest is the word Lewis that has been written, and it's bleeding. It had been written into his skin, and supposedly Ronnie never touched it. So they decided that seemed to be a sign, and they should go to St. Louis, which is how it became the St. Louis exorcism, because that's where the exorcism actually started. Uh, They managed to make it there, uh, moved in with some relatives, in a little town called Belnor, which is a suburb on the north side of St. Louis. And um, things just did not get better. They got much worse. Uh, Ronnie had an older cousin who attended St. Louis University. It's Catholic University in St. Louis. And um, she went to her advisor, a man named Father Raymond Bishop, told him about what was going on. And that's how the Jesuits got involved. Uh, He went to the house to give Ronnie a blessing, saw Things were completely out of control. There were things flying around. You know, he's screaming, he's howling, he's, you know, he splashes holy water on Ronnie and it stops. The bed stops moving, all kinds of things. Finally, he gets another priest involved, Father William Bowdern, who is essentially he's Father Marin from The Exorcist. I mean, that's that's who he's based on. And uh, he's this kind of wise, you know, priest who's seen a little bit of everything. And he becomes convinced that Ronnie is possessed. And they were able to get permission from the archbishop at the time to conduct an exorcism. But they had to keep it quiet, not because the church was embarrassed, but because the church was in the middle of desegregating all of their churches and schools at the time. And the archbishop had recently said that anyone who went against this order of, you know, allowing African-Americans into the churches and schools, if anybody went against this, he would excommunicate them. And this became a huge deal. And so the last thing he wanted was word of an exorcism taking place in in the archdiocese. So they were supposed to keep everything really quiet. And this exorcism went on for almost six weeks. During that time, Father Bowdern lost about 40 pounds uh, from the stress and the Time was spent. They were conducting exorcism rituals every single night while doing their regular day jobs during the daytime. Father Bowdern was a pastor of a church. Father Bishop was a teacher. And they had an assistant named William Halloran, who was a seminary student at the time. And he had to attend to all of his normal things that he did during the day. So Walter Halloran outlived everyone else. Um, I was able to interview him several times before he passed away in 2005, and he turned out to be a really great witness to a lot of the stuff. Um, One of the first times he was ever at the house, and, and the reason he was recruited is because he was a big guy. He played football, he was a boxer, and because exorcisms can be so violent, they needed someone who could hold Ronnie down And that's kind of where we get into this, you know, you start to question the reality of a lot of it. And you have to kind of step back and go, well, why in the world did it take oftentimes four or five grown men to hold down a skinny 13 year old boy? They they had to hold him down onto the bed and and sometimes couldn't do it. Uh, Father Halloran, who later became a priest, Father Halloran often said that, you know, they could barely hold on to him. He could fight. Uh, he once uh, punched Father Bowden in the, or Father Hallard in the nose and broke his nose. Um, I mean, all kinds of very violent things that he did. And, um, you know, there was the, you know, the, the screaming and the howling and the using different voices and the, um, 
you know, the the the, the thrashing and the, the fighting and the the constant urination and the smells. And uh, he said that that Ronnie could get up onto the bed and could vomit, like spit vomit, eight, ten feet across the room and hit people in the face with his eyes closed. Now, he's he's witnessing this. This is a guy who was there. So you can hear all the stories you want, but when you hear it from a guy who saw it, you're, you're you know, it, it takes on a new reality. And as I was getting back to the very first time he was ever there, he said that he was standing at the foot of the bed and Father Bishop and Father Bowden were on both sides of the bed. And he's knelt down because they're praying for Ronnie and they're in the middle of the exorcism ritual. And the the bed that Ronnie is on is shaking so hard that the mattress starts lifting. He said it lifted several inches off the frame. And he looked over at Father Bishop and Father Bishop just shook his head and go, don't worry about it, Walt. Just keep praying. <laughs> and I'm thinking, OK, about that time, I'd probably run for the door. But so which I guess gives you a, an idea of these guys were, were pretty brave, no matter what you want to believe this was. Well, like I said, the exorcism went on for weeks and weeks, and it eventually ended up at uh, the Alexian Brothers Hospital, which was uh, it was the first psychiatric hospital in St. Louis. They didn't use straight jackets or handcuffs, but they did have secure rooms where patients could be strapped to the beds, which is what they had to do with Ronnie. And uh, that's where things really got out of control. Um, I don't want to get too deep in the story. I know we're going to have to take a little bit of a break, but I do want to tell you that one of the witnesses there, one of the Alexian monks, um, I was able to interview uh, seven years ago in 2014. Um, his name was Greg Holowinski. He was a monk. He'd been a monk his entire life. So here's a guy with no reason to lie. I mean, what would be the purpose? Um, especially because he has cancer and he knows that he doesn't have long to live. So his family had contacted me and said that Greg wanted to tell his story because he'd never told it before. Wow. So wow. obviously I'm going to, I, I jetted on up to Milwaukee to get the story because I didn't want to miss this. And um, he was there again. He was one of the people that was there. He saw these things happen. He saw Ronnie reach out and grab a prayer book and have it disintegrate in his hands. He saw Ronnie grab the stole around Father Bowdern's neck and watched it fall apart into threads. He had a glass pitcher fly across the room uh, when no one else was in the room and shatter against the wall, narrowly missing his head. And the one thing that really got to me was that he said that he was there trying to hold Ronnie onto the bed one day during one of the exorcisms one evening. And he swore to me that Ronnie levitated 12 inches off the bed. He swore to me. Hmm. He said to me, Troy, the devil was in that room. You could feel it. Wow. I mean, I asked him six different ways. Are you sure he was possessed? And he said, you'd have to be an idiot not to think this kid was possessed. So, you know, um, I mean, we could talk about all the causes and the theories when we when we come back. Um, I don't want to, you know, get in the middle of something and have to take off. But, we you know, this is a it's a fascinating story. It's just so I mean, I've been I've been digging in a story for like 25 years. I mean, obviously, you can tell I'm a little jazzed about it because I haven't stopped talking for like, I'm sorry. No, for no, like no. 20 minutes straight. I don't think I've even taken a breath hardly. But. I, and I just I have to leave out so much because like I want to I got to make this I got to get this story in here so you can hear it. But it's um, it's one of those things that can keep you up at night, man. <laughs> it really no can kidding. when you start thinking about it hard enough. No kidding. I mean, my goodness, man. I mean, I have so many questions for you. Yeah. yeah. Regarding this case, because, you know, there's a lot of people as society becomes more agnostic and more. Uh, towards leading towards their own spirituality rather than you know any type of religion we, we're not hearing a lot of these true cases of demonic possession anymore you know I don't know why maybe they're dying off maybe they're congregating on the other side for a war who knows but we're going to continue this conversation exorcism in St. Louis 1949 one of the greatest storytellers of the paranormal is here Troy Taylor 
You can find him. AmericanHauntings.net is the website. He's got over 130 books, people, to add to your paranormal collection. And they're all damn good. Damn, damn good. Troy Taylor continues the exorcism story when we return for Hour 2 of Spaced Out Radio right after this. All right, dude, we're clear. Okay, cool. Dude, I, I think I think all of us were just like on the edge of our seats <laughs> listening to well, this. Well, yeah, it's it's one of those things where I mean, if I start telling the story, I'm, it's the whole two hours. So I don't, yeah. you know, I I can't, I don't want to do that to you. But oh, you I, can um, a story like there's this. There's stuff in can. there I want to get in there because it's just so weird, you know. And I, you know, I don't even know. I, I don't, I think that as far as demons go, I don't think that I think that I don't, I think that the Catholic church and I have a different idea of what demons are. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not saying that they can't exist. Um, I just don't, I don't, I don't know that they're, you know, fallen angels and all this kind of stuff. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. But um, I, um, I think there's something to this story. You know, I really do. So I oh, don't yeah. think it was oh, made yeah. up and I don't think it was a lie. So the, this is just incredible. incredible. You know, it's funny because when, when I get the echo in my headphones, it sounds like I'm on a ghost box in the back. <laughs> do you have a light on that goes on behind you? Or is that a TV or something that's on? I think it may be the TV. It's just weird because all of a sudden the wall behind you will light up. And yeah, yeah. Die I off. think it changes scenes on the TV. I just I don't have any sound on, and it's just like just on. And when the scenes change, it flashes a little bit. So right. Yeah, I'm not used to doing this in my living room. I usually do this in my office, and I thought I'm not going back to the office. I didn't know I was going to be on camera. I'll just stay here. <laughs> oh, okay. so, uh... the hair looks great. The beard looks great. Everything's working for me, man. Hey, Rich Hilke, how are you? Uh, just uh, everybody in our chat rooms, just so you guys know, um, I want Troy to finish this story, and then what we will uh, what we'll do is, after he's done the story, we'll take some questions. I don't want to interrupt him because I think like like uh, you guys are all like me right now. We're all kind of on the edge of the seats, trying to uh, you know just. Uh, envelope ourselves in this story so um let's uh just hold off on the questions until troy is completely done and then we'll uh get to some questions from you guys because i know you guys already have questions for him so uh i know you'll be cool with that uh jenny met says troy you look great oh well thanks <laughs> somebody's ask about the radios but I lost it somewhere. I'm not. I don't do very well with the um, words moving on the side of my screen. <laughs> That's like an old man. All the words moving over there on the screen. Um, I saw somebody ask about radios. Yeah, I, they are a bunch of radios behind me. So I don't know who that was, but uh, I've got a got this like a bar area in the back of the movie room, and I just it's lined up with old radios. So well, here's it's one of those things. Here's an interesting comment. <laughs> Beth says that her dad performed exorcisms in their house. Yikes. That's a story. Yeah, no kidding. Hi, Troy. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> wow, different Troy. This is Troy SR-71. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's a book right there, Beth. Beth, you should, uh, if you remember any of those, I'd like to bring you on to talk about them. Holy cow. Bigfoot Anon, how are you? Project Blue Book, good to see you, buddy. We've got about uh, two minutes here, just over two minutes. Okay, sure. Yeah, this is fantastic. Fantastic radio. Well, 
Well, apparently Gina Armstrong is listening on here somewhere, but I don't know if she's on the in the chat no, or not. She, she isn't in the she's chat. She's hearing us now. Very cool. Hi, Gina. Let's see here. Yeah, Beth, we need to uh, talk offline. I want to hear about these. Can you uh, message me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram to send me a DM? That would be great. I assume her father must have been a minister of some kind. Yeah, I guess so. Either that or a witch doctor, one or the other. <laughs> Some kind of shaman, I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Paula um, on Twitch. How are you doing? I like it when people pop into the chat room because then I can see where they Yeah. We got uh, about one minute. Yeah, her dad was a pastor. Oh, okay. Fab, uh, unfortunately, Lynn did not break off her engagement yet. I'm sorry, buddy. No, those aren't spirit boxes, Paula. That's We're getting some weird echo happening where my voice is coming through <laughs> on Troy's end. Uh, <laughs> you want me to try to turn it down some more, Dave? Uh, no, we're good, man. Sure? Okay. Yeah, we're good. All right, big thank you to Cat Chaser for the awesome super chat. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Thank you to all the veterans who are tuned on in. We absolutely love you, and uh, you always got a good home here at Spaced Out Radio. And all our regulars on Twitch and YouTube, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We love you. Here comes our number two right now. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two on Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are in this beautiful planet we call Earth. I want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Umbratilus. Umbratilus is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with an incredibly exciting true story of an exorcism back in 1949 in St. Louis. Telling us the story tonight is paranormal author Troy Taylor. And Troy, what a storyteller you are. His website, AmericanHauntings.net, if you want to check it on out. Troy, right before the break, you were talking about this young gentleman named Ronnie who a young 13 year old who was possessed allegedly by demons and the priests, both uh, the Catholic priests, other priests, monks, all trying to figure out how to get this possession out of him. I mean, this is just incredible, my friend. Well, it's, yeah, it, it, it's one of those stories that like I said, it has, I mean, I haunted me. That's too easy, but it has, uh, for about 25 years or so, I've been digging into it ever since then. Um, you know, I, I think what I think I first got interested when I found out that you know I'd always heard that The Exorcist. You know, I, I, I'm a horror film buff. For those of you who don't, you can see the posters behind me who are watching this uh, online. I'm a horror movie buff, and so The Exorcist was always one of my favorite films, even as a kid. And then I found out that it was based on a true story. And that the true story came from St. Louis, which was awfully close to home. So I started digging into it and um, found out that the true story was just as frightening as the as the fictional film. In fact, even more so because 
you know, not only was it true, but that, you know, in the movie, at least there's a, an explanation as to why this girl gets possessed. But in real life, we don't know why this boy ended up being possessed. We really don't. Uh, we just know that it went on for about six weeks and it wasn't until, um, around Easter of 1949 that, um, things really started to sort of shake loose. Um, the, the priests involved knew that whatever was going on was going to get worse before it got better. And it did. Um, in fact, just before Easter, uh, Ronnie, um, then began not just in the daytime or not just at night, but in, even in the daytime began to act, um, very much unlike his normal self with the fighting and the screaming and the howling and the cursing and the using different voices and the, you know, the urination and the, all the stuff that was going on, you know, was just unlike this, you know, polite kid that, you know, people knew during the daytime. Well, now even in the daytime, he attacked three of the Alexian monks. Um, he had attacked Father Bowdern, uh, physically attacked him and all kinds of things were happening. And they knew that, they were going to have to bring this thing to an end. And eventually it did end. Um, according to Ronnie, he had a vision of, uh, he said that it was St. Michael, or at least an angel with a flaming sword that drove uh, this, this creature into a cave that he locked the door behind. And that's the vision he claimed to have had. And he sat up after that and said, he's gone. And that literally was the end of the possession, if, you know, if it was a possession. And that's that's where we get into uh, an area that there's a lot of debate over, because a lot of people think, you know, a lot of people have explanations for this because it's, it is, don't get me wrong, it's hard to believe. I mean, the stuff that I've even just, and I'm not even getting into the details. Um, I'm just getting into an overview of the story, and even that's hard to believe. And I understand that, and I do know that there's a way that you question this stuff it's not that hard to question it especially some of the early stuff when you find out you know as i did with the research that some of it wasn't true you know some of the the, the more dramatic things from that happened in maryland didn't actually happen uh the stuff that happened in st louis at least i have eyewitness accounts of and it does make it easier to believe but even so you know there are those who say that this was all just some sort of practical joke but Honestly, for a kid, a 13-year-old kid to play a joke that would go on for six weeks where he would be subjected to an exorcism every single night, at some point you're going to go, okay, I give up. You know, this this isn't real, and that never happened. I mean, instead things just progressively got worse. I mean, there are people who have, they blamed it on, you know, the religious mania of his mother and his aunt and even the priests involved – you know, all kinds of things people say. And probably the number one thing I get from people is, well, it was obviously it was just a mental illness. He obviously had, you know, uh, some sort of childhood schizophrenia or, you know, multiple personality disorder or whatever, you know. Um, and that's that's a common explanation that I get from people. But, you know, I've, I've looked into that, too, and I've talked to a number of different psychiatrists and psychologists and try to explain all of this to them. And all of them have said, okay, I, I can see where this or this could be, you know, diagnosed as this, but there's no one diagnosis that would explain everything that happened in this case. But let's say there was, okay. Let's say that there is one diagnosis that would explain everything. How do we explain the fact that when the exorcism was over, Ronnie was miraculously cured of whatever this mental illness was? Because he didn't have it at any other time in his life. Once this was over, he went on to lead a normal life. In fact, his life was much more normal and much more straightforward than it had ever been as a kid. He'd had a troubled childhood. He didn't have a troubled teenage year. He grew on, he grew up, he went to college. Uh, he mastered in uh, engineering and psychology. He went to work for NASA. He holds a patent on the uh, foam that they put on rockets when so when they come back into the atmosphere, they don't burn up. That's the exorcist kid, patented that. Got married, had kids, had grandkids, 
passed away last spring after retiring in the year 2000. And this guy went on to lead an absolutely normal life. So how do we explain if that was a mental illness, what cured it? So, so that's as baffling as an exorcism would be or you know, possession or demons or whatever. So I don't have an easy explanation for what happened, but something did because this family would not have picked up and moved halfway across the country. Didn't matter. They were from St. Louis. They lived and worked in DC. So this guy, Edwin jeopardizes his job. They jeopardize their home, everything to move halfway across the country, hoping that moving there or going back to St. Louis would help them. Well, it didn't. Well, eventually it did, but not right away. I mean, it made things worse in the beginning. So, you know, obviously something happened here. What it was, I can't for a fact tell you it was a possession. I can't tell you it was paranormal, but it was something. And if I had to guess, I mean, after, you know, believe me, I, I, I went through all the stages of stages of grief with this story, I guess, with me not accepting it, not believing it, being angry about it being a practical joke or a hoax, and then went on and on and, and looked at all kinds of different things. And believe me, my opinion changed several times, and it always changed to the more mysterious, the more people that I spoke with who were actually there. And when I spoke with Brother Greg in 2014 before he passed away, um, I got to tell you, I left that visit with him, my interview with him. I, I left there really kind of shaken up because I thought I had answers. And instead, I'm talking to a guy who witnessed the worst of the stuff. And he witnessed it without any doubt in his mind that Ronnie was possessed. Now, I mean, even Father Halloran would say, well, you know, um, I can't tell you for a fact that I know he was possessed. I'm not qualified, but Father Bowdern believed he was. Um, I mean, Father Halloran would actually, actually said to me one time, he said, um, well, you know, I, I don't know for a fact he was possessed, but there was this one time that I saw the bed levitate about eight inches off the floor. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> You know, and that doesn't convince you of anything, you know. Um, so I don't know, man. I, um, I I think there's something to this story. I really, really do. So, and you've got questions. Ask yeah, me your yeah, questions. I do. Man. I do. <laughs> Did Ronnie ever have any recall of what happened? Or was he just completely out of his body? No. Um, you know, I when I spoke to him, that was one of the first things I asked him. Uh, is, you know, what, what do you remember about what happened? And his, his answer was that he felt like that it was someone else's life. The only thing he remembered, I mean, he remembered going to St. Louis. He remembered being around his family, but didn't remember anything about the actual um, exorcism. He remembered being, um, being um, taught the catechism and things like that because they believed that, you know, having this information would help him in his spiritual battle as far as becoming a Catholic. And he was eventually baptized into the church. But, you know, he remembered some of those things, but he didn't remember the actual exorcism. And he said that, you know, his, his it seemed like to him, the reason it seemed like someone else's life is because all of his, the memories that he had weren't his, they were other people's his family who told him about things, but that's all he knew. He didn't remember any of it himself. So he had no recall whatsoever on how he picked up this spirit or whatever no, it was. No, no, none at all. And and that's the thing about the, you know, the, the stuff in Maryland, you know, became part of the record secondhand. Um, it was all told by... Um, you know, Ronnie's mother and grandmother to the priests. Um, and they wrote it down in the exorcist diary. Everything else was firsthand. So some of that is is fairly confusing. And, you know, I think that that might have been part of the problem where when it ended, the church did an investigation of it. Uh, the archbishop had a Jesuit professor at St. Louis University investigate the case. And he believed it was inconclusive. 
um, not because of what was seen, because there were 48 people who signed a record stating they had seen um, a possession and they had seen paranormal activity. 48. That's a lot of people. And um, but he decided it was inconclusive because they couldn't really figure out how it all started. And so they decided to keep it a secret. Um, Ronnie's name was never used. Um, they wanted to protect his identity. They filed it all away. They took all of the copies that Father Bishop had made of his diary and they filed them away. And in fact, we would have never have seen any of them if there hadn't been a couple of people who passed them around. And if not for the fact that the head of the Alexian Brothers Hospital, uh, Brother Cornelius, locked a copy of the exorcist diary in the room where the exorcism had taken place. He put it in a drawer in the room. They locked the door and they never used it because the Alexians truly believed it was a real possession, that it was genuine, that it was authentic, and they did not allow that room to be used. Well, in 1978, they were tearing down the hospital and rebuilding it. It's, there's a new one and they were tearing down the pieces and workmen found that diary and gave it to their boss. That's how it originally got out. It was a coincidence. We probably would not be talking about it. And that sounds like an urban legend that somebody found the, the Ark of the Covenant or something. And, but that's, it really did happen that way. And it was just one of those fluky things that it got out there and people started to hear the details about it. I mean, now you could get it. I mean, I've got a copy. I've had one for years and you could get a copy of it now. But at one time it was, you know, not available to the public. So there, you know, there was no other record except for this diary that that Father Bishop had kept during the entire um, exorcism. My goodness. Yeah. I'm really surprised that they labeled it as inconclusive. With well, I think, people. again, I think that it had something to do with, I think there was a combination of things. Um, part of it, I think, was that they couldn't figure out how it started. And the other thing was, is that, again, they did. this is not information that they, this is not something they wanted out there. In the middle of everything they had going on and all the politics that was happening in St. Louis at the time, uh, Archbishop Ritter would have really been um on the hot seat if his enemies and he had a lot of them because we're talking about 1949 here this is six years before brown versus board of education where we start you know trying to integrate things he was a way ahead of his time and so him doing this in a in a city like st louis which was highly segregated you know and always had been because missouri is pretty much a Confederate state, even though St. Louis wasn't part of the, you know, it, w it was still in the Union during the war, the rest of the state wasn't, but it was still a volatile area at a volatile time. And I just don't think they wanted that out there. I mean, it looked like something out of the Middle Ages to most people. I mean, the, those people who had even heard of exorcisms at the time, because that's not something most people talked about in the 1940s, which would have made it even weirder. Now you could probably put something like that out. People wouldn't think that much about it. They might laugh. There'd be always be the skeptics. But, you know, I but at the time in 1949, I mean, these guys, when Father Bishop and Father Bowdern were given responsibility for doing this exorcism, neither one of them knew anything about exorcisms. Nothing. They'd been taught nothing. They knew nothing. They had to do a crash course. But he the archbishop couldn't bring anybody else in because they wanted to keep everything so secret. So putting these two guys in charge, I mean, it, yes, it did work out okay, but it was really a risk because if you, if you believe everything that the church doctrine talks about when it comes to exorcisms, they can be <coughs> extremely dangerous, not just to the victim who's possessed, but to the exorcists themselves. So, I mean, if you, if you believe all those things, and you put two guys in charge who've never done it before, technically you're endangering those guys' lives. There's a lot of sloppy stuff that went on with this. I mean, right. In, right. in my opinion, that at that point in the possession, if you, if, you know, in the alleged possession, Ronnie had not filled the criteria for an exorcism. 
At this point, he had not spoken in a foreign language. That came later. He had not predicted any kind of future events or spoke of anything that, you know, he shouldn't know. In fact, we don't know if he ever did because some of the things that he said during the exorcism were so vile that Father Bishop refused to record them in the diary. So we don't know everything that was said. I have a general idea from Father Halloran, but I mean, you know, come on, I'm not going to like question a priest about, you know, and tell me about exactly what he said about masturbation. You know, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, come on. So I don't know all of it either, but there's a lot of stuff there that, you know, we, we may never know that is part of that record. So, you know, the, again, there's so much that I wish I could tell you that I knew that I don't know. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I feel like I know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> probably more probably more than I need to for a good night's sleep sometimes. Did this spirit or entity ever give up its name? Yes. Um, eventually it did. It said that it was known by the name of Spite. Now, that's what it passed on in a message to Father. There's a um there's a lengthy there was a lengthy couple of hours one night when the exorcism was still going on at Ronnie's aunt and uncle's house, uh, Loris and uh, or Leonard and Doris Hunkler in uh, Belnor. And there was a night where he was being, he was passing on, he was saying things and his uh, cousin Janice, who was uh, older than he was, she was in college, was writing down everything that he was saying. Now she couldn't get everything, but there is a transcript of some of these things. And he was talking about, you know, he would be there for 10 days. He would go away for four and would return. And that um, it's it, that it, its name was Spite. That's what it said. Now, Ronnie, who was, as far as we know, in a trance at the time this happened and was, you know, unaware of what was going on. At the end of the exorcism, when he was describing the angel with the flaming sword that had driven the creature into the cave, he told he told the priests at the time that when this creature was locked inside the cave, that there was a sign above the door that read spite. Now, theoretically, he would not have known this, you know, ahead of time. So. I mean, you kind of have to leave that up to you to decide what you think about that. I, I can't guarantee that that's, you know, legit. But on the other hand, um, that was the name that it gave to the exorcists. Very strange. Very yeah, strange. very strange. Well, it also claimed to be the devil a few times, too. And we know that's, you know, yeah. actual devil. So, you know. but But spite, isn't that one of the seven deadly sins? Is it? I believe so. Um, I don't know, man. I'd have to count them all. <laughs> I don't. Is it? I think I'm so. not sure, to be honest with I, you. I'm looking it up right now. Okay, great. All right. So we have pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wraith, and sloth. Sorry. So okay. It is not. It is not. But isn't, isn't, it couldn't, isn't that a, um, is that a, um, the same meaning as one of the other ones, though? Spite, wouldn't that be? Hatred or greed, greed no. or envy, envy, something. Probably. I don't know. Envy. Um, well, regardless, that's the name it gave. Um, and I said, like I said, though, it also claimed to be a de the devil a couple of times, which is pretty much like somebody who's in in a, in a sanatorium claiming they're Napoleon. But on the other hand, maybe it was talking more metaphorically. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I know what was said. I know what was written. That's what I know. <laughs> Wow. wow. I mean, this is just, I mean, the fact that the guy came back, because we got about 45 seconds left, came back to live a, just a prominent life of education and prominence within yeah. NASA and being yeah. able to take care of his generations with that patent. I yep. mean, that's just incredible. I know. I know. Yeah, it's a, um, and again, you know, if if he was crazy or if he had a, you know, some sort of illness, what happened to it? What happened to it? It just disappeared. So. No kidding. Troy, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. When we come back from the break, we'll take your paranormal questions 
And of course, we will also get into some more Haunted Tales with Troy Taylor from AmericanHauntings.net. Troy has over 130 books out on paranormal, supernatural, true crime. This man is an encyclopedia of the strange and weird, and we love him for it. We'll be back with more with Troy Taylor on Spaced Out Radio, coming up right after this. Troy, I'm just going to take a quick bathroom break. I'll be right back, okay? Yeah, I will do the same. (laughs) We're adding to the entertainment (laughs) online. Be right back. That was an awesome story. You guys have to admit that. That was an awesome story. So stellar, my friend. So stellar. Okay. Good. Hi, Ozzy Steve. And Mr. Cowley, dun, dun, dun. welcome back to the show. Oh, Mr. Cowley loves his spaced out radio. That's all I got. <clears throat> That's all I've created. <laughs> all right. Uh, who else? Ivy Smith has joined us, everyone. Yes, Norm MacDonald, good comedian, good Canadian kid, passing away today at the age of 61. Due to cancer, nine-year battle with cancer. That sucks. He was funny. Yeah. Funny. He'll always be <clears throat> Turd Ferguson to me. Yep. You know, my, <laughs> my favorite role of his was uh, Adam Sandler's dipshit friend on Billy Madison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were laughing. Oh. I, I was watching all of his Saturday Night Live Burt Reynolds uh, things today. It popped up, so it was really funny. Hey, Glenn John McEnroe, the pride of Wimbledon. How are you? Mm hmm. You have a podcast, too, don't you? Yeah. What's yep. it called? American Hauntings Podcast. Yeah. Very cool. We're, about to, we're at the end of our fifth season now, so. Nice. Yeah, it's fun. Where can people find it? Uh, just. Anywhere, literally anywhere, iTunes, um, Pandora, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, all, all that stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's all, all over the place. Sweet, man. Sweet. <clears throat> uh, who showed up here? Devil Wolf, how you doing? Welcome. We've got about uh, just over 90 seconds. Jeff Elder in the other chat room and Spreaker. How you doing, buddy? Is Bill WD40 still with us? It's good stuff, man. Good stuff. 
Young Jazz, it's your bedtime. Mom's going to come in your room and give you a spanking. All right, we got about one minute. Always sing Mr. Cowley if he comes in late. Always. <laughs> Film a lot. How you doing? Welcome to the program in our chat room, man. <clears throat> Big thank you to Noble Patrick and Cat Chaser for the awesome super chats. Really do appreciate the love and support you guys give us on a nightly basis on this show. A super chat is a great way to support what we do. Thank you to all the veterans tuning in tonight. Really appreciate it. And, of course, to all our regulars in the chat rooms, YouTube, Twitch, and on Spreaker. We really do appreciate you guys. Here we go, everyone. The second half of the show starting right now. So stay tuned. Second half of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Reminder to all of you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight talking paranormal. Author Troy Taylor is with us. He has over 130 books on the subject of ghosts, ghouls, goblins, and every cranky spirit in between. His website, AmericanHauntings.net. If you want to check it on out, Troy, welcome back, man. Hey, thanks. Tell everybody about your podcast. Oh, yeah. we um, Well, actually, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> it's, a, it's the American Hauntings podcast, and, a, and a, this, this guy comes up to me one day and says, hey, um, I, I wonder if you'd be interested in doing a podcast. And I said, no. <laughs> Immediately said no. And um, But he talked me into it, and he's now like one of my best friends. But we're also five seasons in. So we, uh, we have a good time with it. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we usually, what we do is we pick a topic for each season. Like our very first season was about Alton, Illinois, because that's the town where he grew up. And so he wanted to do something with it. And then we did St. Louis. Then we did, um, a season on the, um, Villisca ax murders and all the other murders connected to them. And we did a whole season on uh, new Orleans. And then now we are finishing up a season on Hollywood ghost stories. So um, it's been a lot of fun and we're, uh, we're having a good time with it. So I think people, if you like this kind of stuff, the, you, I think you'd like the podcast. So. Right on, man. Well, you're, you're one of the top guys out there and that's why we love having you here as well. I want to continue down the paranormal road with you. And I, I say that no pun intended because you have a series <laughs> of books on hauntings along route 66 yeah yeah how did you um, do that man yeah it's um yeah I, I put that together uh, and i'm actually i i i'm three books in out of five so i still <laughs> i still have two to go uh so i i still need a couple more i still have to finish a couple more of them but um i always had a thing about route 66 i mean i grew up in illinois um you know a spits throw away from route 66 through the state so i mean this is where it started was in chicago and um so I, I just always had a, a fascination with it. I, I like the era. I like um, I like road trips. I like it. So I mean, I I've driven as much as Route 66 as I can. Uh, years ago, I did the trip, and I've done it quite a bit of time in between, jumping on for a while. And it just seemed like a a fun series to do, a series of books. I mean, you couldn't put it all in one book, not if you want to cover every weird story, because it's 
true crime and it's just oddball stuff and vanishing hitchhikers and ghost stories and a little bit of everything. So, yeah, it's fun. Well, I want to ask you because, you know, I'm Canadian and a yeah. lot of our listeners are around the world and even some Americans may not understand the full history of Route 66. Could you give yeah. us a little bit of a, a, a story about this highway and why it's so Yeah, yeah. I, 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 uh, I have a lot of friends out east that'll go, what's the, so what's the deal? Why? <laughs> they, don't, they don't get it. Um, Route 66 was, it wasn't the first national highway, but it was really the first one for automobiles. And so when they put that together, it ran from Chicago all the way to L.A. And uh, they they took a lot of small highways and put them all together and turned them into one big route. And it just sort of became I mean, this is in the mid 1920s, you know, when they were really getting this up and running and automobiles were just becoming a thing. And by the 1930s, everybody had a car. So, you know, people were going on road trips and this was an easy way, especially for people like in the Dust Bowl areas and stuff to get to California in the 30s during the Depression and things. And it just sort of became this um, iconic highway. I mean, we get people who will come to come. They will come to the this country just to travel Route 66. I mean, they, they come through all the time. Uh, through the area and they will you know they'll come through in buses and all kinds of stuff because it's just it's just this fascination that with what with with the idea with the nostalgia of it um and it's you know it's not um it's not for everybody it's one of those it's one of those car culture kind of things i guess uh but it is it is pretty cool and i know that it's it get it, it is lost on people who don't that don't live along route 66 or have any kind of connection to it. Uh, but yeah, I get that a lot from people out East and I didn't even think about friends in Canada. <laughs> it's really lost on you guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, we, we hear about it. We know about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, outside of Bobby Mackey's, we don't know a damn thing about the ghosts along there. Tell yeah, us about some of these yeah. missing I hitchhiker know. stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, you know, um, I mean, it starts in Chicago and Route 66 passes by like the most famous area of uh, where Resurrection Mary haunts. I mean, it, it just it goes right by. In fact, there is uh, just steps away from Resurrection Cemetery where, you know, Mary is supposed to be seen out sometimes on the road. People pick her up, give her a ride. She disappears from the car um, right near there is. In, in these books, and for me as a traveler, as a road tripper, which is something I love to do, um, as important for me as that ghost story is, is right near there is one of my favorite fried chicken restaurants. <laughs> so it's it's all about, Route 66 is all about, you know, not just the ghost stories, but the cars and the food and the weird places and the strange, unusual places, the, the TP Hotel, the... Uh, you know the uh, the 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 car Stonehenge. The I mean the the crazy giant statues on the side of the road. You know the, this is all part of it. And so with ghost stories connected to a lot of these places, with haunted bridges and haunted bits of highway and haunted restaurants that have been there forever. You know that's just all part of the the whole atmosphere of Route 66. Um, even people who don't really have a big interest in ghost stories and the paranormal will embrace, uh, they'll embrace the, the ghosts of the roadside attractions and the highway and the Route 66 and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So these hitchhikers who have gone missing... Were... Well, no, it's not like that. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. I, I should have I specified. Okay. It's not that people that were hitchhiking on Route 66 and disappeared... These are people, these are like that that old legend of the vanishing hitchhiker with a guy who's driving okay. along the road at night, picks up the girl, she says she needs a ride home. He takes her there. They go, he goes up to the porch. The girl disappears from his car. He goes up to the porch, knocks on the door and says, Hey, listen, uh, I, I just brought your daughter home, but I don't know where she went. And you know, when the woman who answers the door always gives him a story about, well, you know, my daughter died in a car accident on Route 66 10 years ago. And he doesn't believe it because he spent the whole evening with her. And she says, Well, I can tell you exactly where 
you know, her grave is if you go out to the cemetery and, you know, the guy goes to the cemetery. When he gets there, he finds the jacket he loaned the hitchhiker neatly folded on top of her tombstone. I mean, it's just one of those stories that's been around forever. But, and, but there's a lot of them around any kind of big highway areas, you know, especially Route 66, which has become famous. Um, it's very near the uh, the Hornet Spook Light, another one of those kind of things that's been around forever. Um, dating back to before there were automobiles, people were seeing this ghostly light appearing along this bit of highway right next to Route 66. Now, Route 66, of course, wasn't there yet. It wouldn't come for another 25 years, but it made a convenient place for people to stop. You know, they opened up a spook light museum there and it had a, like an area you could sit and watch for the light. And I'm sure it had some sort of natural phenomena, but of course, you know, it's a ghost light. So everybody had a ghost story that went along with it. But people would come out to see it. They'd line the roads. And I don't do that so much anymore. It seems to kind of be fading away. But for probably 50, 60 years, people would go down there on a regular basis to watch this light come bobbing along the road. And all there's lots of places like that along the highway. But again, it kind of goes back to our discussion in the very first hour of little towns being haunted that nobody knows about. Well, the people that live there do, and they've been talking about it for years, for the most part. Every town, everybody goes, well, how come such and such town has so many ghosts? Well, because somebody decided to write them down. Because every little town has a ghost story, at least one, if not more. But it just, you have to, they have to be collected. They have to be saved and preserved. Um, that's why I think ghost stories are such an important part of our history. And it all goes back to that again. So we're back to full circle from the very beginning of the show, talking about how important the history is to ghost stories. Just like preserving the history of Route 66, a highway that was decommissioned in 1985, the last stretch of it. It hasn't been a real highway in 40 years, practically, but we still talk about it. We still travel what's left of it because it's important to preserve that, and the ghost stories are a part of that, just like with any of these little towns. I mean, it's... Um, you know, it's 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 an integral part of all of it. Troy Taylor is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. And no, that's not a ghost in the background. I promise you. I promise you. Shar has a question for you. How has all of your investigations changed your belief system? Well, um, yeah, that's that's when I first started doing like actual investigations, um, I was going into it with the idea that um, places I was going to probably weren't haunted, but I wanted to see if maybe something would happen. And a place not being haunted was, or at least active, seemed in those days as important as ones that were. Because when something did happen, it did, um, it did sort of build up my belief system. But over time, as you and I have talked about before, Dave, I don't I don't do a lot of investigations anymore. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, my hearing is not nearly what it used to be. Uh, but secondly, I, I sort of um, got away from all the equipment and the gadgets and the gear because I just am not really sure that that's really doing anything. When my interviews with people have been much more revealing and for me, created more of a belief system that there really is something happening because i mean just for instance i just an example i all oh, oh, i give all the time uh i had a house that i had some people contact me told me their house was haunted uh described what was happening in the house what the ghost looked like etc and asked me if i could find out anything about it well that was right up my alley because i got to dig into the all the history of the house and found out that there really had been uh, some pretty scandalous things that had taken place in the house. And even in fact, a guy who had stolen a lot of money from a local bank had been the original owner of the house and had committed suicide, not in the house, but he had killed himself while living in the house. Anyway, um, I found his photograph and I showed the photograph along with some other photographs to uh to the people who lived in the house and they were able to pick out his photo the guy who owned the house from all of the other photos i showed them and said that's our ghost that's the guy we're seeing now that's compelling enough but 
Then as I was going through digging up the history of the house, I found that some of the previous owners before the people who were living there currently were still around the area. I contacted them. Several of them agreed to talk to me and told me they too had seen a ghost. They described him and then managed to pick out the exact same picture of the guy. That didn't have anything to do with gadgets, gear, gizmos, recorders, nothing. But as far as I was concerned, they had just proved that house was haunted. That was as good an evidence as you're going to get right there. And so to me, that became kind of a turning point for me in the in kind of investigations that I did. Um, and, and, you know, and as far as belief systems go, I would say that, you know, um, things I've experienced, you know, as far as I mean, I, I'm not a psychic. I don't, you know, I don't talk to dead people or anything. If I do, they don't talk back. Uh, I don't hear them anyway. Um, but I um, have had enough experiences that has convinced me that there is something to these things. And I think that was, well, just like going back to this, uh, the St. Louis exorcism. I could read about it all I wanted, but when I hear from people who were actually there, that was compelling. So when I would go to some place and, you know, I would hear a noise I couldn't explain or I was touched or I would hear you know, something, you know, moving or would in a couple of instances actually saw an apparition it only happened to me twice ever in all these years. And I've actually seen a ghost, but that was compelling to me along with the stories, the firsthand accounts. So I guess really my belief system changed my investigations instead of the other way around. You know, me being able to be introduced to the history side of things and my own personal experiences kind of changed how I felt about investigations, which is why I don't really do them much anymore. I love to go to places to be there to experience it so that I, you know, see if something's going to happen. But I don't know that anything ever will. But if it does, then I've just become part of my own story. And that's kind of fun sometimes. You ever bring any spirits home? No, no, I never have. I, I've lived in a couple of haunted houses, uh, but they were haunted before I ever got there, and they didn't move with me when I left. <laughs> so, well, let's get into another story here. We got about seven minutes thirty seconds before we have to go to break here at the top of the hour for you. You know, whether it's Route 66 or any of the crazy battlefields that you have done stories on in the history on. Is there a story that really sticks out for you that hit you emotionally? Um, well, gosh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, there have been, there have been plenty of, I mean, I guess really as far as emotionally goes, um, the only place I've ever been that I was actually scared enough that I wouldn't spend the night um, was the, and I know it's kind of a famous story, but the Bell Witch Cave in Tennessee you know, uh, when you know the whole story behind it, it's pretty scary. I mean, it's a seven year haunting of a family uh, where the ghost actually claimed credit for killing one of the people involved. That's kind of scary. And there's a cave on the property where the farm existed that, you know, I'd been to shoot. I don't know, man, I've been there probably 50 times. Uh, but one time in the middle of all that, I had the opportunity to spend the night inside the cave by myself. And it's the only place that I've ever actually left. And I would not stay. Um, and I can't even tell you why, because, um, man, I, um, I, like I said, I'm not a psychic, uh, but man, it got to me. I mean, it was, um, it was the only time really that I've ever been that scared is that place. And I don't think it's because I thought that the bell witch was going to get me. There was just something overwhelming about it. And that's the only time I've ever really, um, had that kind of feeling um, and I've been to plenty of places where I've been unnerved or, you know, chilled or whatever. Uh, but that's one that, that really got to me. Um, I mean, there are other stories that as far as emotionally goes that I feel like I've gotten kind of um, overly connected to uh, that would be this, the St. Louis case, this exorcist case. Uh, I think I've gotten a little too, probably too deep into it. In fact, this is the only the only book that I've ever written. Um, well, back in 2006, when I was working on this book, and I, I'm trying to watch the time. Uh, when I was working on the original book, I actually had 
I was living in a house that was completely unhaunted at the time. And I was in an office completely unhaunted. There were no ghosts around. There was nothing going on. Uh, but when I was working on the book about the exorcism, I had things disappearing. I had things moving around. I had things I had left in one place that would show up somewhere else. I had parts of the book that were disappearing and showing up in other files on my computer. All kinds of crazy stuff um, that to the point that I really wanted to be done with it. And I was. And um, and I thought, well, that's that's the end of that. I'm not going to I'm never working on anything like this again. And then, you know, the opportunity came for me to update the book and put everything into it um, over the summer. I was working on this book and my office is not haunted. Uh, the building I'm in is not haunted. And, you know, the same stuff started up again. I actually had to replace my computer halfway through writing this book. It just got so wonky acting. I had things disappearing again. Um, I had some letters from Father Halloran that I had had sitting on my desk that still haven't turned up. And there's not been anybody there but me and my cat. So it's not like I've got somebody coming in, moving things around. But I just said to somebody the other day, but the book's done now. And so you buy it. Um, it's it's now it's your problem. <laughs> it's not mine anymore. So I'm not going to tell you that anything comes with your book. But all I'm saying is that now that it's done, I don't have anything going on anymore. Thank goodness. I don't need that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nope. I, 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 <laughs> I don't blame you there. And, uh, yeah. For you, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna save a question from the audience here for when we come back because I think it's a great great question. But for you, with 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 having that emotional tie, getting back to the Blair Witch Project or not Blair Witch, sorry, the Bell Witch, you know what what hit you emotionally in that cave? Yeah, I, I don't, uh, you know, I wish I knew exactly what it was. I mean, this was a story I'd worked on for quite a while, and I had always been interested in it. In fact, um, when I was a kid, I think I was uh, like 11 or so, and my family, uh, we, we used to, we, we'd go on road trip vacations, which is probably how I got into this in the first place with all the traveling, but we would stop at all kinds of oddball places. And we were driving through Tennessee and they had seen a sign or heard something about it. So we went to the cave when I was about 11. That was the first time I was ever there. And I met the guy who had opened it up as a tourist attraction at the time. And um, I mean, nothing weird ever happened. So, I mean, I had had an interest in the story all along. And so I started, you know, collecting things and, and doing some research into it and wrote a book about it about the cave and, and about the bell witch and all that. And so I never really expected anything like that. I mean, I knew how haunted it was supposed to be. And, you know, I knew about all the weird things that happened there, but I didn't expect that it would happen to me, I guess. And uh, I got into the cave and I got back uh, about halfway into the cave where I was just kind of, kind of hang out, you know, in the dark and just be there and spend the night. And, I don't know, man. It's um, I mean, caves are, are weird places. They make a lot of weird noises and things anyway. Water dripping, rocks moving, all kinds of stuff. But man, I um, and I I've spent a lot of time in caves over the years. But Jesus, there was just something about this. The noises and the stuff. I mean, I was convinced there was someone in there with me. And I finally just man, I'm done. I can't do this. Um, I made it about an hour and a half. I don't even know how I made it that long, to be honest with you. I really don't. Uh, but I have never, uh, never thought that I would try that again. So, and I haven't. <laughs> I have not. I just don't do <laughs> caves, man. Caves, yeah. You know, I mean, whether it's Bigfoot or like my yeah. area here, man, you go into caves, there's a good chance you're going to run into bears. You yeah, know, black yeah. bears, grizzly bears, cougars, sure. Bigfoot, dogman, you name it. You, <laughs> ju you just don't do caves around here. <laughs> you know, but I mean, I, I could just imagine, you know, with all, everything that you're going through. I mean, you, you're a pretty level headed guy to get hit like that energetically. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. had to be just phenomenal. Well, the first time I saw a ghost, I screamed. 
like a little girl. Um, so for no reason, I, I don't even know why. I mean, it wasn't like it was attacking me or anything. I just, you know, it just, the emotion of it just hammered me, you know, and I oh, freaked yeah. out. And then when I recovered and tried to chase after it, not knowing it was a ghost, I thought it was an actual person. It looked like a living person and followed it into the room it had walked into and found the room was empty and there was no way out of it. Um, that I, that was enough for me. I was yeah. ready to yeah. leave, you know? <laughs> Troy, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. We have author Troy Taylor for another 30 minutes on Spaced Out Radio. AmericanHauntings.net is his website. And after that, oh, the Magic 8 Ball is going to get warmed up for your psychic questions when we come back on Spaced Out Radio. There we go. Hey, PBR. Uh, hello, gorgeous Gloria. All right. There we go. Uh, if you could just, uh, when we get to break at the bottom of the hour, Troy, just uh, stick with me and I'll uh, give you a proper uh, good night okay. uh, during sure. the break. Sounds good. Okay. <clears throat> oh, did I ever show you this ghost picture? Let me see if I, I can find it here. So. Uh, where do I have it here? You'll like this one. Of course. Now it doesn't want to show up. show you this one but I want to show you the other one too where is it here <clears throat> you know I just had it out the other day and now I can't find the damn thing um, it's usually how it works unfortunately oh, right <laughs> right it's ridiculous and you know when you're in a time crunch too then it really has to become an asshole. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So, try this. Um, take that one there. And where's the other one? Come on. Where did I put you? No, oh, you're not in there. Try this again. What the hell is it? I just had it here the other day. <laughs> you got to be kidding me right now. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Uh, it's because you're. It's because you're looking for it and you're watching the time at the same time. So. <laughs> I, I know I know where there's one online here. Um, photos. Where are we here? Let's, there it is. Move this over here. And let me just figure out my time here. Yeah, we got a couple minutes. All right, so we got this guy twice at a local bard. Uh, I'll share this with you here. Oh, 
Here, let me just expand that. Heidi's comment. And then we'll go here. Uh, so this this guy right here on the stairwell. Uh huh. Yeah, he doesn't exist. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. He lives up here. And we were doing our ghost tours. We'd have to leave him a, so he wouldn't attack people. Uh, he would uh, want a shot of whiskey and a cigarette. Left, oh, yeah. Left on the stairwell. And and what really pissed him off, this picture here didn't piss him off. We were surprised. We didn't get him. One of our tour people got him. Uh-huh. And then, but what really pissed him off was right there, was when we got the second one of him, there's his face, one half oh, of yeah. his face yeah, yeah. right there. And if, if you brought the two together, you would actually see that the same mark right there is mm -hmm. is the same as the mark that you could see right there yeah. right, right there on his photo. On huh. his, so we got him twice, and he after this second photo, he basically said, absolutely no more photos of me. <laughs> yeah, and that was it. Yeah, he attacked me. He attacked uh, my buddy Mark. But here's a cool photo. I wish the person wouldn't have outlined it. But uh, here's a oh, yeah. really cool photo. Uh, this is a, in the barn on the bottom floor. And you can see the horse face. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. So one of the issues that we have at the, at the barn for our tour, which we don't do right now because of COVID, was uh, one of the idiot volunteers uh, who, he was a firefighter for 35 years, so he doesn't believe in the paranormal because he was a firefighter okay. for 35 years, and he'll let you know that. Uh, he um, <laughs> decided in that stall to build a a jail cell. Okay. And ruined it all. Ruined yeah, it all. Right. Great. One second here, boss. Thank you to Jose, Patrick, and Cat Chaser for the amazing super chats. Thank you to all the veterans listening to the show. We're going to kick off hour number three coming up here right now. And we got Troy till the bottom of the hour. Here we go. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. What you got to do is go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Umbratilus. Umbratilus is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the password is set each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. It's a brand new website. I hope you check it on out. we got some really cool stuff on there for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce our guest, Troy Taylor. He is the creator behind AmericanHauntings.net. He's got over 130 books out there on the paranormal. You can find them on his website. Once again, AmericanHauntings.net. And here we go. Troy, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Hey, glad to still be here is and there, awake. Is there any <laughs> paranormal topic you won't delve into? Um, I don't know. Some stuff just doesn't interest me that much. You know what I mean? I, um, I think probably because I'm not one of those people who, um, you know, has – psychic abilities or anything like that i don't i don't really get into all of that too much as far as you know um psychic readings uh that that kind of stuff doesn't interest me that much it's it's um maybe because i don't have any of those kind of abilities it all just seems so subjective that i just don't even 
I don't get into it much, but I really love, um, you know, pretty much anything else. I, I don't do a lot of UFO stuff either. Um, just, I don't know why it's just, it's like somewhere you have to, you have to draw a line of how much you can fit in your brain. So absolutely. And no, I, I know I don't have any erotic ghost experiences, but I wish I did. So, you know, I'm yeah. not I wish here. I could say yeah. up here at Barkerville, we actually, um, we actually have a, an old brothel at the Barkerville Museum where my buddy Merle uh, tells a story of of prostitutes who used to come into your bedrooms at night and all you'd have to do is leave money on the table and they'd come in and for their nightly encounter and he actually tried this one night it didn't work I, I, I have a feeling it's because it's Merle of all people <laughs> but but he actually tried it one night and and the legend is that some people who stay in those rooms at, at night will actually get approached and feel a ghost crawl into bed with them and try to have sex with them. Well, that's uh, interesting. I, I mean, I wrote a book about sex and the supernatural, um, and there were a lot of erotic ghost stories in that book, but none of them were firsthand. So... <laughs> Well, oh, Patty Negri did the same thing, too. Do you know who Patty Negri is? Uh, I don't think so. She's been on Ghost Hunters a number of times. She's oh, okay. a psychic medium out of Hollywood and a ghost uh, tour uh, oh, okay. Okay. provider there. So, yeah, she she did a whole book on uh, on ghost sex. And oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty cool. I mean... I don't know. I've never experienced it. Don't know if I want to. No, me either. I mean, there was that lady a few years ago that claimed she was married to a ghost pirate. Remember that? I do remember yeah. ghost pirate lady. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Totally. <laughs> All right. I, I've asked you a number of paranormal questions tonight. But for you, and I know the thrill of the story is is the big part for you. What's the ultimate story you would like to cover? Oh, boy. Um... You know, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I've got stuff, I mean, I've got a list of things that I'm, projects I'm working on, but I don't, I, at the moment, I don't have like a holy grail. I mean, I've, I've just, <laughs> I've, I pretty much just write whatever I want to write kind of thing, you know, so whatever strikes my fancy, I'll write it up. And um, so, I mean, I've got a list of stuff that I'm going to do, but honestly, I mean, that's my honest answer. I, I don't have a holy grail right now. I really don't. So for you, if somebody comes up, if somebody comes up to you and says, "Hey, I want you to investigate this," what are you looking for in an investigation? Well, um, I said I don't I don't do a lot of investigations anymore myself. Uh, but if somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, you know, my house is haunted, and you know, I think it has something to do with." You know, uh, back in the 1920s, it was a speakeasy. You got my attention, you know, because there's a there's a history there. Um, I did speak to someone recently about a house they were living in. So and, you know, there had been a murder there. So really, I guess what I'm looking for is some kind of background behind the story. And they don't have to provide it. I mean, it might be something that just like that that case I was talking about earlier when I had the different generations of people who lived in that house who all had the same experience. Um, I mean, I, I did the work on that myself. I just needed to know that there was something there that seemed to have some history behind it. And that's, I think that's the key for me. That's what I'm looking for is some kind of history to build this haunting from. Don't blame me. Yeah. Don't blame you. Are, are there any paranormal subjects that are just off the table a lot. Like for instance, I know a lot of paranormal investigators hate dealing with cases with children. How about for you? Um, you know, that has not actually always been a bad thing in my experience. Um, I've had some different places that did have, um, you know, kids there and kids involved, you know, I mean, the thing about kids is, they have a different, they, they live in a different reality 
than we live in a lot of times. So sometimes the stories can be pretty wild. But on the other hand, them living in a different reality means sometimes they're more in touch with something than we are. Um, you know, dogs and dogs, cats and kids, you know, all seem to see and experience things that maybe adults don't. Um, so that's not really a, a no for me. Um, usually what, what becomes a no for me is I'm not really super into, uh, you know, getting away from ghost stuff. I, I try to, to stick with hauntings and, and, you know, and the supernatural rather than, you know, things like UFOs or Bigfoot or something like that. That's not really my area of expertise slash interest. Um, I'm not saying that I don't believe that it's all possible. It's just not something that I really, I don't, I don't have the, the attic space in my head to get into all that too. Would that include something like black eyed children? Um, see that, that almost fits that, that goes beyond ghosts into the realm of, you know, to me, for me anyway, uh, into the realm of things like men in black and that kind of thing. I'm not saying they don't exist. Um, it's just some of this stuff, my, my, my general, my general belief on some of it is that it's much more multidimensional than it is supernatural or even paranormal. I think that I think we we live in in one you know one timeline so to speak you know in a general term, and I think that I I've always thought that's where UFOs and Men in Black and some of that stuff come from. I don't think it's our world. I think they come and go from one world to another, and that's just and that is based on absolutely no research. <laughs> that is just based on me, you know, things I've read, things I've thought. Hmm, that seems possible. And there we go. Uh, just like I think, oh, well, you know, hey, maybe there's Bigfoot out there. People don't realize just how much open woods there are still around, even in places like Illinois, where I live. You know, um, there certainly could be something living out there. But how come we haven't found a dead one? I know there's all these, you know, arguments for all of it. But I guess I choose to I choose to be to, to be a healthy skeptic. In other words, I don't necessarily believe everything, but I'm open to the possibility of it. So I will a lot of times with some of this stuff that gets out of my, you know, my my easy feeling about ghosts and hauntings and that kind of thing. I'll get into, you know, and think that maybe it just comes from another dimension and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> you know, it's just that's just easier for me to just put it there. You know, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, it's I just don't... there's an awful lot of things, you know, and you can only handle so many at a time. <laughs> Do you believe in UFOs, though? This comes from Patrick, and how that might affect religion. Do you, like, do you have an opinion on it? Um, well, I mean, my opinion, I think, would be fall into the same place of of this other stuff. Is there's a couple of different ways to look at it. I think that for one, we would be super naive. Well, let's put it this way. Only humans could believe we were the only living intelligence in the galaxy or in the universe, rather. I mean, I think there's got to be other sentient beings out there somewhere. It's just too big. It's just too big. We can't be the only one. Now, whether or not they would, again, how arrogant are we to think they would travel multiple thousands of light years to come here to see what we're doing, which is not that interesting. Uh, so there's a bit of that. So you you think maybe still again it's possible, but for me I think it gets into that whole um, multi-dimensional thing. I, I'm not convinced UFOs are coming here from anywhere. They they're here. They're just not here. Does that make sense? I mean, not really. Um, they're 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 in our they're in another version of our world. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they're from the future. I have no idea. Honestly, I know nothing about UFOs other than I like the X Files. That's pretty much where my UFO knowledge comes from. No, Again, no, it, can, no. it can only go so far. But, but on the other on the other thought, though, getting into the religious thing, if UFOs did show up and or aliens landed on this planet, um, I think that it would upend religion for people who are religious. Because then they now have to consider the idea that um, the God they believe created them to be just special here on Earth, 
you're not really that special because he apparently did it somewhere else too. So I guess it just all depends on how you feel about those kinds of things. Very so I'm giving you my, these off the cuff answers about something I know nothing about. So I apologize. <laughs> All right, let's get to John's question here, where John is asking, what are your thoughts on ghost trains? You know, I think that the majority of hauntings that we uh, write about, talk about, uh, research, do research on, I think that the majority of them are um, what I've always called residual hauntings. It's just a, a memory history that's left behind a memory on a place and it repeats itself over and over again. And I think that explains a lot of sightings of ghost trains. Um, you know, there have been so many over the years of uh, firsthand accounts collected from people where there have been, you know, horrendous accidents. There have been stories of people hearing crashing trains when there's no trains there. People have seen trains on the tracks. Uh, there's a really great story about the big uh, Florida Keys hurricane that happened in the 1930s about this brave railroad engineer who ran his train backward to try to rescue people to get them off. The only way to get out to Key West at the time was by the railroad that had been built, uh, Flagler's Railroad. And so this guy had taken his train and ran it backward to try to rescue people. And since that time, whenever there have been hurricanes in that area people have seen a repeat or have heard this train repeating itself in the same spot it's a great story i, I mean i can't vouch for it firsthand but it's one that's been repeated over and over again uh one that i've always had an interest in is the um the ghost the train of uh, lincoln's funeral train that ghost train which is you know traveled after lincoln's death the president lincoln um his death traveled reversing the route he had taken to get from illinois to Washington for his uh, inauguration. They reversed it so that people all over the North could view his body. It became the very first public viewing of an embalmed corpse in American history, was traveling Abraham Lincoln across the country. And since that time, there have been lots of reports across New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, even Illinois of this train repeating itself around the anniversary of middle of April, the anniversary of the assassination and the trip back. That's one of those stories that has been around for, you know, 165 years now, and people are still telling it. Um, do I know that it's an absolute factor? I don't know if it's just an urban legend, but as many times as it's been collected in newspaper accounts and first person accounts and people who swear they've seen it, um, I really think there may be something to the story, but maybe it's just a, residual thing but there's your ghost train answer see there's something i knew something about <laughs> it's not ufos <laughs> you know the fraser river here in british columbia in the lower portion between the ocean where vancouver now sits richmond now sits and yale before you end up in the canyon actually has used to have a lot of paddle wheelers on it more so than the mississippi river wow. and and what I'm surprised with is, before I get to Gloria's question, is is that nobody ever reports seeing these paddle wheelers. On, really? Yeah, I'm just blown away by that. Yeah, we have those on the Mississippi. We we get we get a lot of Phantom River boats, so I'm surprised. No, exactly. Let's get to yeah. Gloria's question. Do you have any favorite EVPs that you have heard over the years? Uh, not really. I really, I really don't. Um, I've heard some that have been interesting, but that's one of those things. If you, for me, this is just for me speaking. If you go into an EVP, if you go into it skeptically or even just, you know, trying to apply too much logic to it, they can be anything. And unless you're there when the EVP is recorded, it's kind of hard to know if it's absolutely genuine because anybody can make an EVP and say that it's something. Um, probably the, you know, I, I'll tell you exactly when I started. I mean, I, there's all kinds of criteria that, that, that I've said that this is how you should do an EVP, set it up with all these cameras so that you can monitor the whole thing the entire time. That way, you know, for sure something comes up, but I stopped kind of just genuinely believing in wandering around 
picking up things, asking questions into uh, into a tape recorder. Um, there was this has been years ago, but we had done an investigation at this spot that used to be a um, used to be. It really was a speakeasy and a gambling parlor back during the 1920s and early 1930s. And we'd gotten access to it. It was had been abandoned and had been opened up and we were able to get in there and do a bunch of um, a bunch of investigations. We, we had a lot of really good information and photographs and things out of it. But we were in there one night doing an EVP session and you could hear on the, the tape when we're listening to it as a, our group, we got together, we're listening to all of our audio and you can hear me asking questions. Is anybody here with us? You know, the standard stuff. Well, at one point it says, I said, you can hear my voice on the tape say, um, is there anyone here with us? And you hear a voice that goes, hello, just like that, plain as day. Now, I knew it wasn't any, but no one had spoken. And we hadn't heard it spoken aloud. It had just shown up on the tape. Well, we made a big deal out of this. I played it for everybody. And so finally... But after about a week of this, this a buddy of mine that was there with me that night takes me aside and says, listen, I got to talk to you about this, about this tape. You got to stop playing it for people. And I said, why, man? This is really cool. And uh, he said, um, yeah, um, that's actually my stomach. I had had chili right before the investigation. And that's my I was sitting by the tape player and it was my stomach making a growling noise. Sure. Um, sure. Because I needed to go to the bathroom. And I thought, man, you got to be kidding me. So at that point, I went, okay, we're going to come up with a much better way to do this. And so I don't know. I, so I've heard some cool stuff, but it's just, I don't know. It's hard to say. We have about three and a half minutes left with you tonight. And, you know, I love this uh, creepy audio from your speaker that keeps picking me up. <laughs> Just a- add some creepiness sorry. Right, right to it tonight, but that's okay. I was not prepared for this. I'm sorry. I did not know I was going on camera and all this. I thought I was just answering the phone. That's the way we did it the last time. So I was ill prepared, and I apologize. Handsome so. beard like that, we got to have you on camera again. <laughs> but, but the one thing that I am going to uh, announce right now is that I'm not going to wait another two and a half, three years before having you on again. This was just way too much fun tonight, yeah, man. This was fun. Way this too was much fun. fun. Uh, w- with this, what is your advice to people as we start to close this out who are wanting to experience something paranormal? Should they go looking for it? Should they just let it happen? Should they put themselves in those locations? Well, I mean, that's what I do. I uh, I like to put myself in the location. I, I mean, I don't ever go anywhere. I, I'm not one of those people. I'm not, I don't confront people or taunt you know anything that might be there i don't believe in that kind of thing i think it's is i mean if we really believe that these ghosts are the personalities of people who've died and are now returned to this place just being a jerk to them doesn't seem like the best way to go not to me anyway um, but i do like to go to these places and put myself into the situation i think probably one of the um, the coolest things that you know, somebody came up with a hundred years ago or so uh, were were trigger objects, things that could be connected to the time period or the place, uh, whether it's music or whether it's a thing, and just take it along with you and put yourself out there like, I don't know, I kind of like bait, not, not necessarily bait. I mean, you're not waiting for somebody to attack you, but just to go out there and... Um, you know, and put yourself in a situation where maybe something will happen. I mean, that's that's what I like to do. I like to go to the places, experience them, and see what might happen. You know, spend the night somewhere if you can. Sit in a dark room. Sit in an old graveyard. Just make sure you have permission to go to these places first so you don't get arrested or something. But go out there and do it. You can't sit at home and, and watch TV and expect for something to happen unless your house is super haunted and, you know, doesn't like – ghost shows on tv you know the the best thing to do is turn off the tv and go out there and experience the stuff for yourself for you what's your plans from now until the end of the year work 
It's that time of year. It is that time of year. You know, everybody always laughs. Oh, ghosts only come out of Halloween. Ha ha. No, it's because this is the time of year that we have to cater to the general public. I mean, all you guys who do this and all of us who do this all the time, we know that any place that's haunted or if there's ghosts, it's all year round. But to the general public, they want to come out in October because they think they're supposed to. So when you're in this business, you got to make hay while the sun shines, as my farmer relatives always said. So uh, that's pretty much I don't have another weekend off until Thanksgiving. So very cool. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Troy, I want to say a big thank you for you coming on Spaced Out Radio once again and sharing an incredible story about exorcisms and everything. You're one of the best out there, my friend, and I, I mean that wholeheartedly I to you. That. And uh, definitely going to bring you back on much sooner, probably you know in the next uh, four to eight months, that's for sure. That's good, man. All right, Troy Taylor, everybody, his website, and I suggest you check it out, AmericanHauntings.net. You can find all of his books there. There's 130 to choose from. Yeah, that's an author. Never puts the fingers off the keyboard. Coming up next, I'm going to warm up the Magic 8 Ball. Let's get psychic here. See what we got for our audience with their questions next. All right, brother. That was awesome. All right. Cool. Thanks, man. This yeah, fun. man. Yeah, man. I really appreciate that. And it's so good to be, uh, to reconnect with you. You know, yeah. you get so damn busy. With, oh, you know, I know. I know. You know, so no, I really appreciate it. And thanks to my team for tracking you down. We'll make sure that we uh, get you in here uh, probably January, February sure. around cool. there to make things happen again and kick off a, uh, uh, get you to do a review of the ghosts of 2021 or sure. something like that. Yeah. Sounds good, man. All right, brother. I'll let you go get okay. some sleep. All right. Well, take care. Take care. All right. Good Bye. Night. All right. Troy Taylor, everyone. How fantastic was that? That's good stuff. Hi, Thurston Howell, the third sass quatch. What's happening? Got the Magic 8 Ball here. Starting to warm it up. Yeah, man. That was a good show. Fun show. Sorry about the audio there, guys. Sorry about the audio. Um, he, He wasn't in his office. Hey, gorgeous Tristan Stevens, how are you? Uh, He wasn't in his office, so... He um, set up his computer at home, and he didn't have headphones, so the feedback was coming through his speaker. So that's why it sounded like I sounded demonic every now and again. Mm Hmm. I was just going to mention this, Chad Smith. Thank you. Our new website and merch store. Go to spacedoutradio.com, check it on out. Ben from UFO Garage has literally taken the idea of a cool website right out of my head and put it right on the internet for you, for you guys to check on out. We got a great store there. Uh, Today we sold a number of t-shirts, number of t-shirts today, and uh, we also sold a Merle hat. Yes, a Merle hat. How cool is that? So... Make sure you check it on out. We've got some really cool swag. It's another great way to support what we do. And then when you get your swag, what I want you to do is I want you to take a picture of it because we have a cool section on our website that is a fan zone. So if you haven't seen our new website yet, I'll quickly show you here. And let's go spacedoutradio.com. We'll share the screen here. Oh, look, there's there's Lynn Wallington right there. Little Lynn Wallington. You go right here. Shop. And check all the cool stuff out. Look at that. A Chad Smith shirt, everyone. You can look like Chad Smith by your own Chad Smith t-shirt with a wrench on it. Yeah. How cool is that? A Chad Smith t-shirt. El Ovni Volador. 
There he is. El Avni Volabdor. The Woo Factor shirt. Bigfoot. We Own the Night. Another version of We Own the Night. I love this color. SpacedOutRadio.com You got aliens? Right there. Merle. Tomorrow night, by the way. Merle. The Woo Train shirt. And if you click on these, it's not just shirts. No. You can click on, let's say this Chad Smith shirt here. And look what we got here. We got Chad Smith stickers. Chad Smith mask, if you're still into wearing one of them. And, yeah. That's how it goes. That's how we roll around here. You know, see what else we got here. Let's check out this one. What do we got here? Look at that. We own the night hat. How cool is that? How cool is that? Friggin' cool. What else we got here for swag? Hoodies, shopping bags, coffee mugs, water bottles, camper mugs. Yeah, that's how we do it here. That's how we do it. Spacedoutradio.com Mm-hmm. Maybe I will get some Chad Smith undies. I'll have to talk to Ben about that. Thank you to Ozzy, Steve, Jose, Patrick, and Cat Chaser for the amazing Super Chats tonight. Really do appreciate the love and support. And uh, get your questions ready because it's time for the Magic 8 Ball. And we need your questions, so fire them up here, people. Based out radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for using us as your entertainment source for the night. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the night, here we go. All right, once again, it's time for the Match Gate Ball, where we are going to ask some questions from our audience in our chat rooms to see what is going on psychically in their lives, because that's all part of the woo factor that we do around here on the Mighty SOR. We're going to kick things off with Sandra here. Sandra is asking, because we just put a, built our new website, we've got a new store there, and, you know, we've got stuff for Merle, we got stuff for Chad Smith. Who's going to outsell who? Magic 8-Ball. This is who Sandra wants to know. And Sandra, reply hazy, try again. Too early to call right now, Sandra. Too early to call. Merle is up on Chad Smith right now. All right. Amy, down in Vegas, looking lovely tonight, Amy, by the way. She is asking, will Michael ever contact me back in the near future? The answer is, for Amy O, Intel looks good. Intel looks good. There you go. All right. Good luck with that, Amy, by the way. Sasquatch is wondering, is Dave ever going to eat breakfast at 10 p.m.? The answer is no. Let's see if we got a smart-ass Magic 8-Ball tonight or if he's actually going to tell the truth. Levels are positive that I will eat breakfast for 10 p.m. 
No, 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 Magic 8-Ball. Are you joking around with me right now? Let's find out. Are, are you joking around with me? Intel looks good. See? It likes to play me there. Likes to play me there. Let's go down to Australia. Science Melinda is asking, Does my mother-in-law need an exorcism? Without shaking the Magic 8-Ball and finding an answer, Science Melinda, the answer is yes. 98% of all mother-in-laws out there need some sort of exorcism. I will never forget my first marriage. I was dancing with my ex-mother-in-law, and she whispers in my ear, I am going to be your worst nightmare. And I laughed it off. Oh, I should have never laughed it off. Ever. The spawn of Satan was so rude to me, she didn't even acknowledge my child for a long time. Truth. Truth. Personally, I think she was still upset a house landed on her sister. Yeah. So, let's see what the Magic 8 Ball has to say for you, Science Melinda. Does ex or does the mother-in-law need an exorcism? Intel looks good. Yeah, you get her some you get her some God's holy water very very quickly here. Do that. And be careful while you do it. Mother-in-laws are scary. If I had a choice to come face to face with a with a ravaging grizzly bear in the British Columbia forest here or my ex-mother-in-law I think my chances of survival are better with the bear. I really do. All right. Race fan is asking, will Taco Bell open up a location in Dave's town? So fast food wise, the only thing we have is Tim Hortons, Subway, A&W, and Dairy Queen. No KFC. No McDonald's, no Wendy's, and surely no Taco Bell or Taco Time. You know, I'm sure there has to be some executive from Taco Bell Canada that lives in some place where we're being broadcast. Help a guy out. Get a franchise here. Dave's hungry. The answer, levels are positive. Oh, let's hope. Let's hope. Oh, that would be so generous. Maybe somebody from Taco Bell is listening. I hope so. Fabster wants to know, is Vinny still breathing? Yeah, Vinster has been a little silent for about the last 10 days. So let's find out. Is Vinny still alive? Where's Vinny? Magic 8 ball? Don't count on it. Ooh, ooh. Maybe that's not an answer that we want. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Vinny's just on hiatus. He's just on hiatus. Mm. I hope that one ain't true. All right. Fat Bass is asking, should I go astral in 2022? It is decidedly so. You need to. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Go astral travel. It's fun, man. Go for it. John, Fedora John, is asking, Dear Magic Gate Ball, if I lose my virginity to a ghost, am I still a virgin? Hmm. I don't even know what to think about that one. Let's ask a magic eight ball. If John loses his virginity to a ghost, is he still a virgin? Reply hazy. Try again. All right. We'll try again. 
Infinitely, yes, John. If you lose your virginity to a ghost, you are still a virgin. According to the Magic 8-Ball. B. Hoff is asking, Magic 8-Ball, are the stinky aliens and demons the same thing? Good question. Stinky aliens, demons farting out sulfur, like they've just eaten 14 dozen rotten eggs with some onions and some asparagus mixed in. The answer is yes and beyond. Ooh. Wow. Hmm. Aliens and demons. Maybe the Christians have this one right. Maybe the Christians got that one right. Lynn Sose is asking, Is there an SOR bar on the other side so we can all hang out someday? Good question, Lynn. In hypersleep. Is, yeah. Well, of course, we're all going to be dead, Magic 8-Ball. That's why she wants to know if there's an SOR bar on the other side. Can you answer that? Do we get a bar? Mm hmm. Don't count on it. Why not? Why can't we have an SOR bar on the other side? That sucks. Chris Mo in Austria wants to know. Are you being snarky tonight, your Magic 8 Ball? Sensors read no. Hmm. I think it's got an attitude tonight. Maybe not snarky. Just a little bit of an attitude. Let's go over to Jennifer's question. Jennifer's asking Magic 8 Ball, Is the bridge cursed? What bridge? I'm curious. It is decidedly so. Yes, it is cursed. So if you see a mothman all of a sudden flying around your area, Jennifer, get the hell out. That bridge may collapse. Just saying. Been proof of that in the past. All right. Sinister Vax is wondering, should I go into early retirement? If you're in sales and you take that retirement, you come see me. We may need you. Levels are positive. Retire early, uh, Mr. Sinister Vax. Retire early. Go for it. Enjoy it. You've worked long enough. Worked hard enough. All right. Ivy wants to know Magic 8 Ball. Will the new Ghostbusters movie be good? All clear. Should be. Should be good. I'd like to see that. All right. Sasquatch is asking... Taco Bell got rid of nacho fries. That's terrible. That is terrible news. Should I contact my senator? How do you get rid of nacho fries? That's the perfect side to a burrito. Oh, don't tell me this horrific news. Magic 8 Ball says, Sasquatch, as I see it, yes, contact your senator. There's no way Taco Bell should be doing that again. They already screwed with the uh, the menu a couple years ago. Let's see what else we got from our audience. Michelle wants to know: instead of a bar, do we get an SOR spa on the other side? Out of fuel. Try again later. Not liking that question, man. Logan is asking, Magic 8 Ball, my wife passed gas at the store today, had beans and ham last night. Did anyone walk into it after she ran away out of the aisle like a bandit? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is a brilliant... (laughs) Oh, Oh, I love my audience. Love my audience. (laughs) <laughs> oh that's good yes and beyond 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Oh. Oh, the Magic 8 Ball. This is why we love it. This is why we love it. Logan, you can tell your wife that she literally disturbed some people in the supermarket or wherever store she was in by breaking wind. Hey, we all got to do it sometime. Sandra, will Dave find a bear in his yard? You know what's weird about that, Sandra? Is right before the show tonight, I picked up my boy from guitar lessons and I looked up in my trees because I got eight tall trees in my front yard and that was the first time ever I've actually looked up in my trees to see if the bear was up there. Because he knocked over my recycling last week. Wasn't happy about that. I gave the ghost in my yard a little crap for that. I said, what is that? What is this all about? Anyways... Out of fuel. Try again later. Haven't seen the bear around lately. I don't know uh, if he's moving on or into a different area, but that doesn't surprise me, that answer. And we got time for, oh, one or two more here. Sasquatch is asking, Will Logan's wife throw him out of the house tonight due to embarrassment on Spaced Out Radio? Levels are positive. Logan, you better go get a hotel room because you are in trouble tonight. You are in trouble. It's either the couch or the hotel. Maybe a Motel 6. She might even not even grant you a hotel. You might get stuck at a Motel 6 for this one, man. You just might. I feel bad for you right now, dude. feel really bad for you. All right, let's get to the news. always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire. At the back end of every show, we're going to get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the taco lovers. Video streaming has made sitting through commercials a thing of the past for many. Could a subscription model change the game for taco lovers? Taco Bell is now testing its own monthly service in Arizona, the Taco Lovers Pass costs between 5 bucks and 10 bucks, depending on your location. Guarantees the holder a free daily taco for 30 days. Where has this been all my life? Getting a little emotional here. Anyways, the, the sub- subscription runs through Taco Bell's app, and users can buy the pass at participating locations between September 9th and November 24th. Then, a secret Taco Lover's Pass category will unlock the app, on the app, pardon me, on the menu. Customers can then use the app to order the following. Crunchy Taco, Spicy Potato Soft Taco, Crunchy Supreme Taco, Soft Supreme Taco, Doritos Locos Tacos, or Doritos Locos Taco Supreme. Now, if that doesn't make your mouth water, you just aren't living right now. The Taco Purveyor isn't the first chain to test out in life the so-called subscription economy, in which you could pay monthly for nearly anything, including children's toys, curated wardrobe editions, and even cheesecakes. Panera offers a monthly subscription for unlimited coffee or tea, iced or hot, for eight ninety nine. Pret A manager or manger is rolling out a similar service in the U.S. in September that includes unlimited specialty drinks for just nineteen ninety nine a month. Taco Bell's trial started at seventeen participating locations in Tucson, September ninth, and is slated to run through November twenty fourth. No word yet on possible expansion of the trial. Hey, Len down at Apache Junction for the Rattler. You know, the Rattler where we broadcast, even though someone out there says we don't broadcast on any radio stations, but we're actually on the Rattler. Anyways, get me one of these, man. Get me one of these. One of these days I am going to go down to Arizona, probably before I'm 65 and retired. 
you know, before I'm like, get off my AstroTurf at my campsite for my long, ugly motorhome, I want one of these. I got to test it out. This thing's like heaven. Heaven right now. Now, imagine being me right now, living in a town with no Taco Bell. Horrible. Here's something weird on Facebook. Finding dolls creepy has a long and storied past for the actual phobias of dolls, pediophobia, by the way, to generally accepted theory that dolls are often unsettled due to their uncanny valley effect. Yeah, there are museums devoted to collecting horrible little mannequins, but here's something strange as we continue on. Spooky Doll Hour. What's this all about? The group represents the hyper-absurd end-of-usage spectrum for the platform. Facebook's groups are widely used by communities to connect over anything, and now spooky dolls. Who wants this? Who wants it? I'm not even doing this story. I don't want this. Dolls scare the hell out of me. Mandy the haunted doll almost killed Merle. Captain Shirk trying to scare me there. Shirky poo. Moving on. This one I want to see happen. This one I want to see happen. Bringing extinct creatures back to life is the lifeblood of science fiction. Almost tantalizing, isn't it? Thinking Jurassic Park and its stable of dinosaurs? Well, due to advances in genetics, scientists are thinking of cloning endangered animals and can sequence DNA extracted from the bones and carcasses of long-dead extinct animals. And geneticists led by Harvard Medical School's George Church aim to try and bring the woolly mammoth back to life, which disappeared just 4,000 years ago. Imagining a future where the tusked Ice Age giant is restored to its natural habitat. The efforts got a big boost on Monday with the announcement of a $15 million investment. Proponents say bringing the back of the mammoth in an altered form could help restore the fragile Arctic tundra ecosystem, combat the climate crisis, and preserve the endangered Asian elephant to whom the woolly mammoth is most closely related. However, it's a bold plan fraught with ethical issues. Not many think that it should come back. And that when you're one, you're done. Oh well. Oh well. Let's see what else Shirky Poo has for us here. And squirrels on a survey. New boa constrictor species found for the first time in 133 years. It's actually kind of cool. In the tropical arid forests of the Caribbean, a new species of boa slithered undetected by scientists for over a century. The tiny snake, dubbed the Hispanolian vine boa, has wide eyes, a unique zigzagging scale pattern, and a square snout. Real cute guy. If you like snakes, I'll keep it in a picture if you don't mind. And you know what? I think we'll call it the night right there. We'll call it the night right there on the news. Thank you, Shirky Poo, for the wonderful news for tonight. We really do appreciate that. And a big thank you to everybody playing along on the Magic 8 Ball. And to Troy Taylor for coming on in, hanging on out, telling some really, really cool paranormal stories. His website... AmericanHauntings.net 130 books he's written over the years 130 That's a busy guy, man We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal Rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio Rocking us in and out of every single show Get your horns up for the guitar god himself Special thanks to everybody listening in at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, make a mistake. We're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us.
us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night.